our January ILC meeting. It's great to see you. Thank you to those of you that are joining us online, as well as those of us uh, that are joining us here at the room um, at the ESC. <clears throat> so for today's meeting, we have um, some community partners that will be joining us. Stark Community Foundation will be here, as well as the Akron Zoo. We'll be hearing from North Canton City Schools. They'll be sharing some information with us today. And we have news and updates from our uh, friends from SST9, as well as I Care and the curriculum consultants. So I want to just point out uh, that we have a link to the slides and the attendance back on that first page, so make sure that you access that. I think that Tom is also placing that in the chat as well. Uh, make sure that you sign in for attendance, uh, so make sure we can record that. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on. So I just want to provide a reminder to our friends that are in the room here. We are so excited. We have had uh, technology upgrades in many of our rooms here at the ESC. With that being said, the technology upgrades have improved so much that um, all conversations, whether they be in the middle of the room, the back of the room, the corner of the room, the front of the room, they're all able to be heard very well. So um, just a reminder, like with your sidebar conversations, you're going to want to be very careful with those. Um, we tested this out. I had Brian, uh, Tom, uh, Matt, Chris, there are many of us testing this out. And even uh, whispering, it will pick up even whispering. So I just wanted to make you aware. I would want to know that if I were sitting in the audience. So I wanted to make you aware of that as well. So that's really just an announcement for those of you that are in the room with us today. All right. So for our agenda, we are going to be hearing from Amy Wisegrove from Stark Community Foundation, as well as Michelle Camo from Akron Zoo. Again, Dave Pilati and Kim Knighty from North Canton City Schools will be joining us today. And then we're going to be hearing about some opportunities and updates regarding ACT mini sessions. We'll hear from SST9, iCare, and our curriculum consultants. Just a reminder for our participants that are joining us off-site, uh, just make sure that you are muting your microphone, except uh, when you're speaking, and then utilize that chat box. And I know Tom does a great job uh, facilitating that conversation there and, and providing us with information and questions that you ask. So appreciate that. And just adhere to the norms, if you would, please, uh, when you're joining us off-site. Um, just a reminder again about attendance. Um, go ahead and you can use the link there or use the QR code, whatever is best for you. And then again, the link for the slides is located on this page. So at this time, um, I would like to welcome Amy Wisebrode from Stark Community Foundation. She is the Director of Donor Relations and a Program Officer, and we are excited to hear about the great work at Stark Community Foundation. Amy, are you on the call? I believe she's on the call. She okay. is, and she's muted. Amy, could you unmute your mic, please? Yeah, Amy, could you unmute your mic, please? She said she's trying. Okay, that's fine. All right. Amy, any luck? <laughs> If it would be all right with you, Amy, I think what we'll do is we will maybe forward on to the next part of our agenda and hear from North Canton City Schools. All right. Okay. It's all about being flexible. We need to be flexible. So uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome our special guest from North Canton City Schools. Dave Pilati, Assistant Superintendent, and Kim Knighty, Director of Technology. Uh, they're here today, and they're joining us uh, off-site, but we are so glad that they're here. 
They're going to be sharing with you a challenge that they faced in the district and how they overcame that challenge. So I'm going to turn it over at this time to Dave and to Kim. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, I'll kick this off and then Kim will do probably 90% of the presenting, if not more, and I may just jump in here and there. But, you know, our challenge, and I think probably all districts are facing this challenge. I know that Kim um, has been uh, throughout the year on uh, listservs with other technology directors across the state, and they've been facing this challenge. And the challenge is, you know, when a substitute teacher comes into a classroom today, it's vastly different than it was uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and, and most likely vastly different than what it was before March of 2020, as so much more of our learning now is through online platforms and had been obviously before March of 2020, but even we all districts have made much more of an attempt since then to be prepared if we ever had to do it again. And so with that brings the challenges of how do you provide access to that type of learning that takes place in the classroom when your cl normal classroom teacher isn't there. And in this day and age, we have to make sure we don't share passwords and we maintain network security. Um, so it's really been a tough, tough challenge and, and uh, one that our tech department has been looking at for a while. And, and I'm going to turn it over to Kim because we're really excited with uh, the solution that they have come up with. Um, we are in the very early phases of implementing this solution. Um, so we don't really have anything to tell you as far as how it's going, except we had one teacher that piloted this um, this uh, option, I guess you would say, before we decided to implement it district-wide. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Kim, our Director of Technology. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Dave. Um, so yeah, this was a big problem we kept hearing from our teachers. And I know even when I was in the classroom, I used a lot of digital tools back then. and. Um, even then, you know, it was like, how do I do this when I'm gone? And I was kind of, I had to go backwards, you know, I had to print things and, and have a stack of papers on my desk. So with such a digital environment now, what do we do when subs come in? We don't want to create accounts. And, and I should clarify that we're talking about short-term subs. So with a long-term sub, most districts, you know, we create accounts and, and we pretty much set them up to have access just the way that the classroom teacher does. But with a one-day, two-day, five-day, 10-day sub, um, we're limited on what we can do. So we kept hearing, um, you know, pleas from our teachers. And I don't know, one morning I woke up and thought, wait a minute, could we do this, you know, this way? So um, between myself and my system administrator, John Pano, we kind of came up with what we think is going to work for us. Now, I'll preface this and say, and actually, if you wouldn't mind, I I'm, I'm, don't know if I, yeah, I was going to say, if you could even go to the next slide, please. Um, we have, you know, specific uh, technology that we use here that's allowing us to do this. So this is not a one size fits all solution. And I apologize for that. I wish I had a one size fits all solution, but um, we have, uh, we have uh, Lo Lenovo yoga laptops for our staff and our, they use um, a device called a screen beam to connect to our projectors. Uh, our kids have Chromebooks. Um, we use Schoology as a learning management system. Uh, we heavily use uh, Google Workspace as well. And then we have a lot of, as, as all of us do, curriculum tools and other things that we use. But it was the combination of um, kiosk mode with the Google Admin Console and uh, Schoology that allowed us to create this. So if, if, um, if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, again, what we wanted uh, teachers to have a way to communicate with their subs substitutes to have safe access to digital materials to be able to project in the classroom and then really limited disruption to learning um, because you know that that's the thing uh, i was talking to my husband about this and we all know sometimes your lesson plans don't go the way that you were going to do them you have to completely create different lesson plans when you have a substitute coming in so there is a disruption of learning and we, and we want to minimize that what we didn't want was to create an account for a short-term sub to give them access to our network. We didn't want our teachers leaving their laptops in the classroom. And I know you may find this hard to believe, but some of them do share <laughs> their login credentials, which kind of makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. So um, we knew that it's happening out there. And uh, what could we do to give them what they need um, and still keep everything safe? So if you could move to the next slide. What we ended up deciding to do was to use kiosk mode access to Schoology. 
So in Schoology, you have courses and you have groups. And what we've done is, is use the group option. So we're actually using, we, we purchased Chromebooks, um, 14 inch, the bigger, a little bit bigger than what our kids use. More looks like more of a traditional laptop. Uh, and we are using it in kiosk mode. We created generic sub accounts for each building in Schoology. And we did that by just, we can actually create an account rather than have a single sign on account. We can just kind of create a generic account inside of Schoology. And then we can lock that account down. We can give it a role where um, we can set permissions and kind of keep it very locked down. We're generating a QR code through Schoology for that login, and I'll show you how this works um, in a slide or two. Uh, we're, we've created a substitute group for each building. We are adding this um, generic account for the sub to each one of those groups. And then we've created folder systems. At first, we were just gonna like list all of the teachers, but instead of scrolling, we decided we would maybe try to group them through grade level or uh, subject matter, just depending on the buildings, the way it works. Uh, better for for that particular building. And then in those folders, we're creating individual folders for teachers. So if you could move to the next slide, please. Um, when the substitute comes to Kim, the building. Kim, if I can jump in just a quick second. Yeah. Kim mentioned we purchased uh, Chromebooks for all to use with all of these substitute teachers. And we used ESSER funds for that because we made the justification that certainly um, the role of a substitute teacher is much different now than it was before the pandemic. And they have to, with so much of the learning, if not all of it, or most of it being um, through online platforms, a lot of times they need that access. So that's how we uh, found the money to purchase the Chromebooks. Thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we, so this is kind of what they're going to get when they come to the office in the building for which they're subbing. So you can see uh, we have the, we purchased cases, um, and then we have the Chromebook in there. And then in the front, we have the charging cable for the device. We have, we went ahead and got a wireless mouse for them just to make it a little more convenient. And then we actually have a cable in there because in our rooms, we need that cable for that substitute to physically connect that Chromebook to the screen beam, which is that wireless, typically wireless connection uh, to our projectors. So the other item that will be in there is, you know, a laminated page of instructions and, and, you know, I don't know, we may end up putting other things in there as we go, but that is kind of what the kit looks like now. The other thing they'll receive is a, they always get a lanyard, you know, because um, for security purposes, when they're in the building, they always have a lanyard. On the back of the lanyard is where we're going to put the QR code that they're going to use. So if you would go to the next slide, please. Okay, so when they log in, or I'm sorry, not log in, when they open the Chromebook, if they wait just a moment, they're going to see this uh, page load, this kiosk mode page, and it says, you know, click on the, on the second tab to get access. So it gives them kind of directions on that front uh, when it first loads. They click on the second tab and it, that's what brings up the QR code screen. So they'll take that at the back of that ID badge hand or hold it in front of the camera on the Chromebook. And then that will take them into Schoology. So next slide, please. Once they get into Schoology from there, the only thing that they can do in Schoology is get to the group that we have assigned them to. So at the top of a Schoology page, they're going to click on groups. And then depending on the building, um, it, it'll come up with only one group available. In this case, I'm using Greentown um, as an example. So that sub would cl click on groups and then click on the, the group to enter. Next slide, please. Once they go into the group, we have a couple options. If you're familiar with Schoology or Canvas, um, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't have a lot of familiarity with Classroom. Um, but, you know, there's always kind of like a, a, a Facebook feed, if you will, um, of updates where you can leave messages or, or whatnot. So could be the building principal, could be a, a team leader um, who leaves uh, an update, some instructions or whatnot for them. But what they're really going to want to do is get into the resources folder. So if you would go to the next slide, please. On the left, there's a resource link when they click on that. And those are just to clarify two separate pictures on this slide. So the picture on the left shows how we decided to kind of break them down the first level of folders by grade level. So when I get to the office, I know that I'm here for third grade 
um, for Mrs. Cropper, you know, if it's a subject, you know, you, you know how that works, right? So um, they will kind of enter the folder for which they are there to sub. When, when they open that folder, then on the right-hand side, that picture shows the list of the teacher names. So then they just look for who they're subbing for. After they click and open that folder, thank you, um, that, then, then it's up to the teacher. So the teacher then controls what goes in their folder. I, I can see this and, you know, I'm planning to do some PD with our staff of, around this, but um, you can see our teacher who was um, kind enough to help us pilot this. You know, she has a read me first folder. She has um, slides needed for the day so that, that that substitute then is able to click on that link and open it and project to the class. There's lesson plans for the day that they can either, sometimes they may just need to read that themselves. Other times the teacher may ask that they're displaying this and going through it with the students. But it's basically like your subfolder, right? Only digitally. So it, it would be up to the teacher to keep that up to date, um, to you know clean it up. Or I, I was thinking, you know, we, I used to always have some kind of activity on board if there was an emergency. Um, you know, you could have a folder in there, you know, and just leave a couple activities that you would want them to do in, in the absence of, you know, if an emergency happens and you can't get anything in that folder. So there's a lot that could be done. Uh, the nice thing for us about this is that because our teachers house everything in Schoology, this is a, a not a heavy lift for them. They just copy their resources that they're already using into this particular folder. Um, so it's not something where they have to recreate the wheel. Uh, now, that, that being said, they can also, you know, create things as well. And actually, if you'd go to the next slide for me, um, on the left, there is a picture of all the different things that you can create in a group. Uh, you can add folders, you can, you know, do, add files or links or whatnot. One thing that is an option um, that we try to remind our teachers is uh, it's add page. And it's great because it's almost like um, it's it's like me handing you a page, only it's a digital version of that. So you can title it. You can you see that you have a, a, an open you know text box there where you have all of your editing tools. You can um, embed resources there. You can put pictures. You can put links. You can record a video of yourself or audio of yourself um, in there. You you know, and then at the bottom there are other, other things that you can attach as well. So you can kind of embed it within the screen or you can attach things down below it. But it's great because when they open it, I mean, it's literally like I, I handed you a page. So it, the possibilities are limitless. I mean, I was thinking if it were me, I would love to leave a video of myself talking to my kids and saying, hey, here's here's what we're going to do today. Um, and that substitute would have the ability to open that up and connect and, you know, broadcast it to the class, um, you know, without just kind of having to read directions. So it could be directions straight from me. Now, some teachers don't want to be <laughs> on camera, so um, I'm aware of that, but it is an option. And I think a lot of our teachers would, would appreciate having that ability. So it's almost like you being there in the classroom with them to some extent. Okay, and then next slide, please. Um, so again, just like a physical subfolder, materials can be left in this digital folder. Uh, I think it's great because all the teachers in the building also have access, right, to all these folders, and a lot of groups of teachers work in teams. So maybe if there is an emergency and somebody's out, someone else from the team could populate the folder for that teacher. Uh, it's nice because everybody will be in the group and have that access. And then again, I'm really interested in professional development around this to see how far we can take this. So that is our plan. Anyone have any questions for Kim? And you know, I'll, I'll just say we know there's about I think eight or nine districts, uh, ESC districts that use Schoology. There's at least one or two I think that use Canvas, and and there may be a way to do this with Canvas and maybe with Google Classroom. But um, this was just kind of what we're going to try. But Anyone who is interested in digging into this certainly can reach out to Kim and Kim, and along with our network director who really helped on this, would be happy to uh, answer any questions or help people work through things. Kim, one question I had at the high school level, I'm sure you guys are experiencing the same thing we are, where we have high school teachers out of their conference period, and so you may have five people, six people covering one teacher at the high school level. Are they using this? 
uh, same platform uh, when you're using your in-house staff? You know what? what? We haven't thought about that, but we absolutely could because they, again, would all have access to the group. So, yes, I mean, we that's, that's actually a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and, and Mike, um, we only we really haven't rolled this out. As, as we said, we've only got one teacher that's tried it so far. We just got the Chromebooks in, I think, last week. Um, but, yeah, that's certainly been the case uh, this week. If you guys are experiencing what we're experiencing, the sub situation uh, did seem to get better for about four weeks prior to we, we were averaging about two and a quarter classrooms per day without a sub across the district. This week, we're averaging 11.4 classrooms across the district yeah, per day without a sub. And our, our yeah. teacher attendance is not that much worse. It was on Monday, but I think there's more of a sub shortage now than there was before break. Anyone else have a question for uh, David Kemp? I need to know. How many Chromebooks did you purchase for each building? So we uh, we looked at, I don't know if you know Dave Pilati, but um, Dave likes spreadsheets and numbers. Well, actually, you just heard him use a couple. So, <laughs> sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, that's actually a good quality. That's a compliment. But um, he, he had tracked how, how many substitutes, like what was the highest number per building that we ever experienced, you know, throughout this. And so we took that number and used that as a worst case scenario. So we ended up purchasing about 85 total that will be spread between our, you know, seven buildings. Um, depend, you know, obviously more at the high school, less at the K2 buildings, but um, we feel as though we'll have enough to cover. And honestly, these devices can be used, you know, in a pinch for other things as well. But we, we feel like we'll have enough to cover even a worst case scenario. It was just then sourcing everything, you know, getting them, getting the Chromebooks in, we're still waiting on the cases, you know, so we would have liked to have rolled it out a little earlier, but um, we're just excited that we have a plan because I'll tell you, I was asking everywhere and it was just crickets out there about how to handle this. So I'm very hopeful that this, um, this is a, a good move and works. And if it flops, we have some Chromebooks we can use. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anyone else? Sam and Dave, thank you so much for your time and just for sharing the information. Um, we love hearing about how districts are attacking different challenges, and this really kind of evolved naturally through emails from Dave and bringing Kim in the loop, and we really appreciate that, and it's great to hear ideas from people as well. as like, we could use this. Have you thought about this? That's really what we want this network to be about. So thank you again, Dave and Kim, for, for participating and sharing your information with us. Really appreciate it. All right, we're going to check in with our friend Amy Wisebrod. Amy, are you able to hear us right now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Well, Yay! We're so glad to hear you and see you. Thank you. Sorry about the inconvenience. I had my no. window too small no and I couldn't problem. see how to unmute, but. No problem. Let me introduce yeah. you. So Amy, again, is the Director of Donor Relations and a Program Officer at Stark Community Foundation. <coughs> Plus, she's a, a wonderful person. I had the opportunity to meet with her just uh, recently. So excited for you to share, Amy, what's going on with Stark Community Foundation. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And do I guide the PowerPoint? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I'm here today, um, and thank you very much for having me and allowing me a few minutes. I want to talk about Think Big. Um, we started this initiative. If you move to the next slide, please. We launched Think Big in 2019 to give residents a platform to share their ideas, thoughts, opinions on how we can strengthen our community together. This concept of organized community conversations started with the Chicago Community Trust in 2014 with an annual event, maybe you've heard on the table, that is a platform that's used across the nation. But since then, again, it's been replicated across communities and often spearheaded by community foundations. So we talked about it for a few years and then finally just said, let's do it. Uh, we'll find the resources and the time. So we are hoping that Think Big is just the beginning of sparking meaningful dialogue in our community. 
we encourage our community to continue chatting with their family and friends about these difficult issues. But I'm here today because we had powerful conversations with our youth in our community. To back up, you see in 2019, we had like a general sense of areas of topics that you could choose from, anything from you know food insecurity, transportation, education, and mental health, and that went well. But over the years, we've switched focuses. And in 2020, of course, because of everything going on, we switched to racial equity and inclusion. And those conversations were virtual, as well as last year when we focused on poverty and in particular childhood poverty. Uh, we put out the data report protecting Stark's future. And I'm sure you know, in 2018, Canton City was reported as the worst childhood poverty rate in the nation, which was very striking and unfortunate. Next slide. So again, why am I here talking to you? Because we had powerful conversations with our youth. I was very impressed. I sat in on several of them. You know, we've had all these adult conversations. They were very successful. But I thought I thought the richest reward was when we talked with the, your school age children. We um, incorporated this conversation or curriculum into Tom Todd Ideas, into the Stark County Leadership Youth Academy and the All In Conference. So again, we're here to talk about, or I'm here to talk about why youth, we wanna engage them in tough and meaningful conversations. As you know, the more we teach them, the younger they are, the better adult they'll be. We wanna inspire them to think differently and advocate for their friends. So what I'll show you in a minute is a simulation that we put together that's very powerful and makes you think you know, don't judge people that walk in late to the room because you don't know what their day has become. So we also want them to learn from their peers. You know, we want this constructive conversation um, with their teachers as well. But most importantly, to, again, provide that empathy and understanding. Next slide. So we this year, again, we decided to have um, a simulation. Before, it was just general conversations. This year, we have Claire, a real-life simulation of a typical family living in poverty in Canton. We partnered with the United Way this year, or in 2021, and they provided valuable information, real-life statistics and budget and information, and we created Claire. So the next slide will show you a brief video, and this is so powerful. It's eight minutes, and it's all the facilitator needs to guide these conversations. But I just wanted to show you a snippet of it. So if you can play that. This year, we're presenting Think Big in a unique format focused on a very prevalent issue, poverty. This is Claire. Claire is a single mother working to break her family out of the cycle of poverty, and she needs your help. During your community conversations this year, we challenge you to brainstorm solutions that help Claire escape poverty. You could focus on her transportation issues, her health care needs, her children's educational needs, her employment dilemma, or any other specific topic, or you can take a broad approach by focusing on multiple aspects of her situation. Let's break down Claire's story. Claire is an African-American single female in her 40s who has lived in Canton for all of her life. Claire has three children. Her oldest child is a 19-year-old boy. Unfortunately, he was caught with drugs as an adult and now has a criminal record. This causes extreme stress for the family because he is unable to find employment and still lives at home, barely contributing. From time to time, he helps his mother care for his younger siblings when childcare is not available. But otherwise, he is a typical teenager off with his friends and on his phone. His biological father, who is not the father of his younger sisters, is absent. 
Claire's second child is a 13-year-old girl. She is an eighth grader in public school, has severe dental needs, and suffers from trauma, PTSD, depression, and anger. She struggles with her academics, which requires Claire to take off work without pay when she has to attend school meetings. She is frequently the caretaker of her younger sibling while Claire is working and childcare is not available. Remember, her brother barely contributes. Claire's youngest child is a three-year-old girl. She is potty trained and enrolled in daycare, which is a subsidized cost. But Claire struggles to pick her up on time due to inconsistent public transportation. This leads to extra costs for overtime care. The girl's father is in jail, so Claire is not receiving any child support. So as you can see, this video provides all the detail that a facilitator needs. It goes in, as you saw, into great detail. Um, there are positives in her life while uh, that snippet sounds all negative, um, but it's reality. And that's what we want people to talk about. How do we bring this family, Claire and her children, out of poverty? The link that you see there is the link to the eight minute video that provides more detail. And the next slide I'll show you is a detailed budget. This again was created with the help of United Way in one of their programs and is true to being on a subsidized income. Claire, as you'll see in the video, is facing a decision whether to take a raise and, you know, you use this budget to discuss this. Um, as you know, this is called the benefits cliff and the dilemma is enough for this conversation in itself, um, but really widespread in the poverty section. Uh, I would guess teenagers, even adults, couldn't imagine why somebody would excuse me, refuse a raise, but it becomes abund abundantly clear when you look at our budget. The next slide, please. This is what we call a placemat, or it is, you know, your brainstorming notepad. This should be handed out before the conversations begin, and the video is shown. Um, it provides great detail at the top, again, so they don't have to take notes on um, the family situation. But all of these resources can be found on our website, thinkbigstark.com. Next slide, please. So we're asking you as educators, as administrators in the education system to think about incorporating this into your curriculum. And really how easy is it to host a conversation? Hopefully very easy from all of the resources that we created. You pick an area of interest or you keep it general and talk just about Claire and her situation and how to get her out of poverty. You choose your best time in your best class or your, um, you know, where the area of interest is a, applicable to the class subject. Uh, brainstorm ways about how Claire can escape poverty. Uh, you'll see in the video that there there's a dog, a stray dog that they took in that they couldn't refuse um, because her children were begging her to keep the dog. And lots of conversations said, get rid of the dog. Like he's costing money, get rid of the dog. And then there's a lot of conversations on the other side that say this dog provides mental health for the children. Um, so a lot of interesting conversations can come from just the details of Claire's story. But then we ask if you can just ask all the participants to take a brief survey because that's where we capture the big ideas and then put the big ideas out to our nonprofits in our community. So again, we're asking if you could consider hosting these conversations. These would become your events. I would love to be invited to as many as uh, you want, but again, these are your uh, events and designed to you know, be however you can, but maybe it can be an annual event that you know, your history class or um, even English class teacher because she loves the idea of 
um, debate. I don't know. I'm making things up here. Um, but, you know, perhaps this can become part of your curriculum is the hopes. We want to continue these conversations. And again, I thought our youth conversations were the most powerful. So then I thought, how can I reach the most school age children at one time? And of course, I thought of you. So next slide just highlights our website with all of our resources, that video, the placemat, the survey, but then also articles on poverty, articles on the benefits cliff, um, and more information. So again, thank you very much for considering hosting Think Big Conversations. You know, maybe it's just one time a year, but it would be great to empower our children and to think differently and also, again, have empathy for those, their neighbors and friends in their class. So I'll pause for any questions. I see it. Yes. Our youth have big ideas. They do. They came, they had, I'm telling you, they were the best conversations. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have any questions, I put my email in there please reach out, but um, I would love to help if I can in getting this started in the school system. But if just one school did it next year, it'd be a success. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, we appreciate you. Thanks for taking the time to join our meeting and to share the information. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Yes, thank you. All right, next up, we are going to transition to hear from our friends at SST9. Do we have our friends joining us um, today from SST9? Lori, Colleen, or Carol? Are I, I'm here. Um, so let's see. I'm not sure. Hi, Daryl. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, let me, uh, sorry, pull up my notes. <clears throat> I hope that everyone had a um, wonderful break and um, that you all stay healthy. Uh, and I am Colleen, for those of you who don't know me, and um, Terrell and I will be giving you some updates from um, our entire team here at SST9. So we have, um, as you know, we have uh, lots of professional development opportunities for you and your staff to take advantage of. Um, we do have live PDs uh, that we are facilitating. Um, we do have our book studies, our second semester book studies. Uh, registration went out before break, and this closes January 14th. Um, the book studies begin, I believe, January 24th is kind of the window, and they go until May 20th. Um, most of them are done way before that, but um, that is our window for the second semester. But the registration closes January 14th. Uh, we've already had lots of, um, of your staff register for book studies, but it might be something um, that you would uh, consider sharing with them. Um, some of the feedback that we've gotten from the book studies is that um, it's really the, the teachers in particular really like it because it is something that is um, giving them an opportunity to learn about something that is um, interesting to them. They appreciate that professional uh, conversation and, the, and time with colleagues, you know, even not in their district. So um, still consider sharing this, even though it is a busy, stressful time. Um, some of them are, are saying that they're using this as kind of an outlet, as a, as a stress reliever for them because um, they're enjoying reading the books and talking with their colleagues. Um, On-demand PD, uh, please let us know if you have any ideas for on-demand. Um, we have those updated, but we're here to help you. Um, like we said last time, we really looked at the one plans um, and are trying to develop our PD and support to go along with what you all have put in your one plans. But if there's something that you need or that you're thinking of, 
um, that you wish you had, uh, let us know and our team will work on developing it. Um, we are working on that team learning with facilitation guides. Um, that still is in production. Uh, so please make sure that um, once we get those out, uh, that that would be something that really would be beneficial for your principals to help facilitate BLT conversations or TBT conversations. And again, if you have ideas for those, let us know. So please email your SST lead consultant or you can put your ideas in the chat. And I see that Lori is on with us, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Okay. Thank you, Colleen. I appreciate you, um, as always, being a team player because I was fast and furiously hitting buttons and couldn't get anything to work. So uh, thank you so much for, for being a team player as you always are. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. And um, just as uh, Janelle had said earlier about the networking opportunities through the Inst Instructional Leadership Council, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to network with you as well. And as Colleen has so um, eloquently uh, stated here, we, you know, we are here to provide you and your teams uh, the professional development, the coaching, the uh, support that you need uh, as far as continuous improvement and anything else. So this morning you'll hear just a few things that are on our plates. And as Colleen had said, our team is uh, working feverishly to uh, meet your needs through a variety of streams, as she's already pointed out. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as we're talking about those different opportunities, we have uh, we have developed our, our uh, monthly newsletter in the Samore fashion. The January Samore came out earlier this week. Uh, we're hoping that that is uh, useful for you, that it is a useful tool to keep you updated with what's going on in the coming month and, 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 and beyond. Also, um, it is our hope that you are sharing that uh, with uh, teachers, building principals, and so forth. We aren't bombarding everyone's uh, inboxes with the newsletter. We're bombarding your uh, mailboxes with the newsletter and hoping that you are disseminating that. Um, but we may we may choose to to disseminate that more more widely. Uh, our regional leadership network is one of our networks that is very successful, and uh, we have um, Dr. Uh, Doug Reeves leading us through that this year, and we're hoping that you're enjoying that. Our EdStep support network, our team works. I can't even tell you how hard our team works to ensure that the districts in cohort two, and of course our friends in cohort one, and those yet to, uh, to, to, to take this adventure in cohort three are well prepared. Uh, so the uh, FY23 question should be released any day now, um, and that is that has been confirmed. So if you're waiting for those, they are coming soon to a theater near you and on the ODE website. Uh, our regional literacy network, another network that is just phenomenal. Um, our DEI, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging educator network, practicing principals network. We have our early childhood uh, network. We have our special education network, school psych network. I mean, it's, you know, the networks uh, are definitely an opportunity for collaboration to learn from one another and um, sometimes to vent with one another. But uh, so there's a little mental health uh, and support going on there as well. But we're we're very appreciative of the attendance and uh, the participation in all of our networks. And like Colleen had said, if there is a need that you have or you see a need for uh, some type of support, we are very receptive to explore that with you and, and to learn more about your needs. Next slide, please. So our dear, our dear friend, Dr. Karen M. Williams Leadership Award. Last year, we postponed this um, during the, the pandemic, and we, you know, we just, um, as a team, decided that we would uh, just kind of put a pin in this. But we are so excited to be able to uh, to to bring this back uh, to our region. And as you know, um, Dr. Karen Williams was a was an educator and educational leader in Stark County for years. And it was our privilege to be able to work um, the last few years of her life with her and learn from her. Um, there are still very many, several uh, little um, sayings and uh, tips of advice that Karen used to bestow on us that we still remember to this day and remind one another. Uh, Dr. Cindy Class was our last um, 
our last recipient of the Karen Williams uh, Leadership Award. And we ask you as leaders to think about colleagues uh, that you would like to nominate for this award. And should you have any questions about this, should you need some um, guidance, should you need some inspiration, uh, Barb Cockrop or Bar Barb Ewing and her team uh, oversee this uh, Leadership Award and kind of spearhead this. So uh, please reach out to Barb should you have any questions. And I believe now I'm turning the baton to my colleague, Terrell Schreit. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So I'm gonna tag on to Lori's um, information about the uh, Karen M. Williams Leadership Award. It is also time to start thinking about our RA Horn Outstanding Student Achievement and Franklin B. Walter Outstanding Educator Awards uh, in the area of special education. Um, you all have been so supportive of this over the past several years and even last year and all the um, happenings in the districts that were going on. We did receive, uh, I, I believe, almost 40 nominations last year for students and several for, for educators. So we are looking forward to um, your participation in this work again so you can honor your students and your educators and remember that teams Educator teams can be nominated, um, and we love that because we love the teamwork aspect of people working together to make sure that our students are getting what they need. Uh, the nomination emails will come out tomorrow. We're finalizing those right now, and the deadline will be the same as the Karen M. Williams Award. It will be February 11th. Um, we do What we do with all those awards is that we select, we have a selection committee for the region for Stark, Wayne and Holmes counties. And we select a regional uh, winner, for lack of a better word, um, for the outstanding student and also for the outstanding educator or educator teams. We do use a rubric to make those decisions. And there's uh, multiple representatives on our selection committee from different audiences and, and also from the districts to make sure that um, we really look at the information. And the reason I tell you that is because on the nomination form, there is a set of six questions um, for each category, you know, for, for the student and for the educator. And the more data or evidence that you can put on those forms really helps the selection committee make those informed decisions. If there's just one or two sentences, um, that might not be enough to, to really explain um, how outstanding the student and our educators are. So if you can just share that with your staff when you're when you're um, thinking about who's going to be nominated, uh, we, we would appreciate that as a selection committee because we want to give everybody an equal opportunity uh, to be considered for that regional award. So uh, could we go to the next slide, please? So this is the big exciting news that we have. Um, you know, last year, because of everything that was happening, we really just uh, sent the awards to the districts. We put some pictures on our website, but it wasn't our typical. Those of you that know, we usually have a spring conference and we would recognize all the nominees and the uh, selected winners from each category at our conference. Well, we are putting the conference on hold this year, but we are going to try to have an award ceremony in person at RG Drag on Saturday, March 12th. And the time for that is 9.30 to 12 p.m. And this is going to be a fun celebration. Everyone that is nominated and their families will be invited to this and also district personnel who are, you know, who want to attend and support their students and or uh, educating uh, educator or nominees will be invited. So we're really excited about that. So save that date. If you are nominating, um, you know, which we know you're going to, if you're nominating people, please save that date on your calendar. Um, and we are going to pray hard that we get to get come together and have some fun and, and really celebrate uh, all the things that, that your staff and your students are doing. Next slide, please. So now that we talked about the fun, we have to talk about the business. <laughs> So special education profile reports, they were released on December 16th. Um, some of you do already have access to that in the OHID account. Uh, if you don't, get with your special education administrator and they will uh, get you a copy and or get you access to those. Remember that these, this data is related to the 20 federal indicators that are used to determine how states and then how districts are using their um, IDEA Part B funds to serve students with disabilities. Next slide, please. 
those 20 indicators are chunked into five big groups are young children with disabilities, meaning kindergarten, uh, coming to kindergarten ready to learn, our children with disabilities achieving, um, our youth with disabilities prepared for what happens after school. Um, do you implement IDEA uh, services? And that's basically the data pieces. Um, you know, are you reporting your data? Are you doing it in a timely fashion? And then the last biggie chunk there is are children receiving equitable services and supports? There are some indicators that your district may not have um, data in and or a rating because you may not have a big enough end size of that population of students to report that. They do mask data to ensure that uh, confidentiality is kept. So if you're a small district and you only have a few students, you wouldn't get a rating in a particular category because it may um, identify particular students just because of the, the number of students that you have. Next slide, please. <coughs> This is a list of dates. Um, I share this with you because you have to remember that this is a team effort. Although it is a special education report, almost all of the indicators relate to what is happening with instruction and service delivery in your buildings and in your districts. So special ed directors cannot do this by themselves. They need your help. They need other staff help. So remember that um, we really need to do this together as a team. Uh, an SST consultant, whether it's uh, Val Pack, Leanne Wigman, or myself, will be supporting any districts that do have non-compliant findings. So no worries, we're here. And those of you that have worked with us in the past know that, that we do everything we can to help you get through the process and actually to have outcomes that make a difference in your district. And many of you have seen that in the past um, through this work. So it's kind of like, oh my gosh, I have a non-compliant finding, but then the results of doing that work make you a better district and improve the services for your students and also for your staff. So we're really excited about that. And I know this is kind of last minute, but we do have a special ed leadership uh, network meeting tomorrow morning from 8.30 to 10.30. In the first hour, we're going to be going a little bit deeper into the SPP, just talking about the indicators, ask, uh, answering any questions, just kind of a general overview. And you are all invited to attend that. I put the link right on the screen. You don't need to register or you can get with your special ed uh, admin and they can help you get into the meeting. But we will do from 8.30 to 9.30. We'll be talking about SPP and indicators. And um, remember that this data should be incorporated into your one needs assessment and your district plans and your one plans. So it would be a great thing if you have an hour to give us, uh, if you're not familiar with the special ed profile, to hop on and get some information to help you with your district uh, district's overall plan. Next slide, please. This is just a quickie update about alternate assessment. You all know that the test window is coming soon. It is the first test window that opens um, in the spring. All the materials are available in the portal. It is an online test for anybody that's new. And, and the majority, about 99% of students do take it, 98% of students do take it online. There is a paper version. Your district would already know who, uh, you know who you needed to order for and all that. Your district test coordinator handles um, all that with your special ed admin. The one thing I just wanted to talk about was training for new test administrators. It gets very confusing. And so the training regulation is that if your staff, your test administrators for alternate assessment have been trained at any point since this new assessment started in 2013, I believe 2012, 2013 is when it started. Um, if they've had a full day of training with the SST and or last year took the two hour online modules that that are created now for the alternate assessment, your staff has met the training requirement. If you have new staff that has not ever done that, does never done six hours with the SST or has not participated in the online modules, they are required to participate in that test administration certification course that is in the OHID account. Or actually, it's in the portal. I'm sorry, it's in the test portal. If you need information about that, please contact myself or Leanne Wigman and we can help. But just make sure that your, your staff has the uh, required training. In addition to that required training, um, we do offer a three-hour refresher every year. We have a morning session and afternoon session. 
And we recommend that especially new TAs attend that because the online modules really only talk about how to operate the computer for the testing. It doesn't go into how do we ethically and reliably administer the alternate assessment with validity. It doesn't talk about those things. So um, we hope that you get new staff to that. And then any staff that, because they only do this once a year, um, that would like to just come and, and be able to ask questions and, and just get a refresher on how do we administer this test. Okay, next slide, please. And I'm going to turn this over to Colleen, I believe. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Terrell. Uh, I'm back. So um, I'm going to close this out here with uh, just a few more slides. Um, this is our Emergent Literacy Series. And um, these dates, there's a three parts to this series. And uh, participants will explore the components of early literacy, phonological awareness, print awareness, and oral language and vocabulary. Um, these essential Emergent Literacy components align to the simple view of reading uh, as seen on the slide. Uh, participants will learn strategies for developing these three components. So um, the link for this is in our SMORE, as is um, we have the links for almost everything that we've talked about are included in that SMORE. So if you're not sure where to find them or we didn't place them in the chat, you can look there. You can also contact Holly Kemp for assistance with registration for this. And um, please do note that these dates originally in our um, fall brochure that went out, they, they were changed from those original dates. So please make sure that you take a look at those if you have some early childhood friends who need this training. Up next, um, we, are, we have some information about PBIS. So we're excited to offer the next level of training in the implementation of the PBIS framework. Um, this is a joint offering with SST9, Stark County ESC, and Tri-County ESC. Um, so this training will allow you to take your PBIS implementation to the next level. Um, there is a link in the slide deck for more information. Again, it's also in our SMORE. If you click on that, you'll be able to um, get more information as well. And this is an important opportunity for your schools to learn how to truly integrate um, the already sis the system that you have in place, such as Care Team. Um, into the work that you're doing around non-academic supports with your PBIS and your MTSS, your, your, all, your PBIS at all three levels of MTSS. Um, this is a team training and it is a virtual experience. So please feel free to reach out to Val, Debbie, or Patty with any questions. Um, but this is a really great way for your teams to really um, strengthen their PBIS and your schools. And um, finally, you know, thank you all for what you do. And uh, don't give up on your New Year's resolutions yet. We're only in the first week. And if you have New Year's resolutions that revolve around any of the work that we do at SST9 with school improvement or leadership coaching or anything like that, please reach out to us. We are here to support you. Um, and we're very uh, proud of the work that you do. And thank you so much for your time and attention. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline, Lori, and Carol for Next up, we are ready to hear from Patty Spencer. We've got some prevention, wellness, and resiliency updates. So, Patty, I'm going to turn it over to you. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here. And I would like to start out to reiterate what Colleen shared about the PBIS Tier 2 training. Um, I've had an amazing intentional um, partnership with, with K-Port and the amazing care team work that they do and our SST9 as we keep working behind the scenes to look at how we more intentionally help you work smarter, not harder. There's actually a PBIS tool that Deb and Val brought our attention to. Um, so really think through who may be from your already um, in place care team 
might be the most intentional um, people to be joining that PBIS tier two training because we're really working behind the scenes, thinking through, Kay's been really looking at the data um, and how we can do the data as PBIS expects moving forward. And um, so um, we welcome you and we'll, we'll be there to support districts um, uh, district by district as as you think through that intentionality and make sure that we are working smarter, not harder. So that being said, I'd like to, um, I'm going to talk about three, three buckets and we'll go to the next slide, please. One of them is um, the suicide prevention piece. When, what I want to make sure too in helping you work smarter, not harder, is there are mandates that, that are before you all, but we also know how time um, and also money are, are just you know commodities we need to be very, very thoughtful about. Um, so just this week, what came out is Cognito, their at-risk professional development is going to be free for educators. It's typically at a, a significant cost, but thanks to our Ohio Suicide Prevention Foundation, it's literally the access will be free from January through October of 2022. Um, the reason that this is important is because it's so simple, very simple. It was years ago, I remember watching this when I was working um, in the mental health system, um, that these simulation courses really help any of your staff at any level, which you need to do every two years just to meet the House Bill 123 mandate, really think through when they see a student, whether they see them in a cafeteria or in a classroom, and they recognize that something just isn't right, or maybe they see something that they wrote on paper or a drawing that they did or just something isn't right, helps that educator th really think through in a simulation way um, how best to, to talk to the student and then give them a warm handoff to that school counselor or you know your care team however you you do that and they've actually added on and, and you're able to click on um, links to flyers with more detail they actually have one now for the early childhood space that wasn't there before years ago um, so it's just an easy way to be able to meet that house bill and it's and it's free for now um, if you're needing to have something to put within your learning management system or within your PD um, days but very brief the other one that I want to bring to your attention, our Ohio, our, our Stark County Suicide Coalition, which Elena at Stark Mar leads, we have a number of trainers in, in QPR, which is just an hour and a half training on um, suicide recognition awareness and, and how to just, again, do those warm handoffs in, to be able to support someone that might be struggling, whether it's an adult, um, your colleague, or, or the students. And so we have a, a vast array of trainers um, within our Stark County uh, Suicide Coalition that can support you in that training, can leave a support if you want to do trainings for families. Um, and I happen to be a, a trainer as well. So feel free to contact me if that's something that, that you're looking for um, to support that House bill recommendation and the fact that we know more and more of our adults and our students are, are struggling today than ever before. Next slide, please. And we want to continue to think upstream. Um, House Bill 123 has as, um, as a mandate coming forth that you have until July of 2023, so you have some time that we actually get content on, on resiliency, on mental health awareness, suicide prevention, bullying prevention, violence prevention, all of that, um, getting it into the hands and hearts of the actual students, that it doesn't just rest in our us as adults, but how we're empowering the students with that content. So that's coming, um, that expectation is coming. I've brought this program to your attention before. The reason I'm bringing it to your attention today again is because I have some intel that I know that the next train or trainer opportunity is actually going to be coming in early March. They haven't put out the registration, but I know it's coming. So if you have, as a district want to learn more about this model, um, 
you know, feel free to reach out to me. I can connect you to the state folks that can give you much more um, information and more detail about it. Um, but not only is the training, which typically is, is very expensive, is free, but they also provide a stipend to the educators, to your districts, um, to support the staff or staff, staff members you have identified to get trained in uh, either the elementary curriculum or the secondary program that, and the secondary program is all about literally training up the middle school and high school students to serve as those eyes and ears and supports um, and contact supports to students. So it's really a way to think about getting upstream. Um, but again, it's just one of the three currently ODE approved evidence based programs. But if you have, I want as we think about connecting dots, because you don't need more programs, more complexities. Um, nobody needs that. But if you have already purchased a really great social emotional learning curriculum or model, perhaps, and um, you want to check to see if that model will meet this House Bill 123, you are always welcome and I would be happy to support the conversation to reach out to the content uh, contact on that link the, on the Ohio Department of Education link and talk through whether that would meet that recommendation or maybe the vendor could add some additional evidence-based content that would help you meet that. So um, I just want to support you in that. Feel free to reach out as you begin to do that planning. I'll, I also um, provide this conversation and content to your school counselors, but sometimes the planning needs to occur at a higher level and that's why we're bringing it to you today. Next slide, please. And um, I want to make sure we take time to, to recognize the fact that as we think about helping our, our students and, and our adults stay as healthy as possible, um, as we heard earlier, animal, animals are like in a very important way. Animal therapy is powerful. Um, and it was just um, over the last few months that Teresa Perthes and Dan Lowmiller connected Kate Portney to this wonderful, wonderful person named Michelle Kimu um, from the Akron Zoo that um, actually worked really hard to get some funding to be able to support Stark County um, um, districts. And she's going to talk to us about what she has to offer. So that being said, Michelle, um, Please give us some hope and some animal therapy. <laughs> Hi, well, thank you for inviting me today. And thank you, Patty, uh, for saying kind things about me personally. That was unexpected. Um, but I just wanted to tell you um, about an opportunity that uh, relates to social emotional learning um, with the Akron Zoo that is available to school districts in Stark County. The background is, oh, next slide, please. Uh, the background is that the zoo did receive American Rescue Plan funding to help uh, Stark County school districts with the transition back to classrooms, pandemic related. Um, the link, uh, if you are so interested, uh, does go to like, um, we got the funding through the Institute for Museum and Library Services. And so there's a brief description of the grant uh, on that link if you are so interested in learning more about that. But the basic goals of the program are for the zoo to provide hands-on sessions to children, um, really in at various phases of the elementary grades um, to help with handling the social emotional or especially the emotional and um, self-regulation kinds of challenges that might relate to having been out of classrooms for quite some time or uh, on remote learning plans and also the disruption to peer relationships that um, were expected as, as you know as a normal part of the pandemic and uh, as patty mentioned um this the genesis or the reason that we even applied for this grant in the first place um, came out of a conversation with Teresa Persis that I was lucky enough to have. Um, and we were just talking about um, like some personal stories of children we knew, one of them being my own child, of just having a real difficulty during the pandemic and, and during remote learning, um, that period of remote learning. 
and just talking through what what it would be like for children in Stark County who had been remote and having to rejoin classrooms where not everyone had been remote and some of the complexities that might be involved in that. So um, happily, we were able to uh, tap into some of the American Rescue Plan funding um, and adapt some longstanding programs that we have, one of which has run in Canton City Schools for a number of years now um, to adapt pre-existing program to kind of meet the moment. But I think one thing to say is that um, even though these programs are, have been as part of this grant project have been conceived of in terms of the, the pandemic, some of the school personnel that I've been talking to really sees longevity and life for these programs existing beyond the one year that we've gotten American Rescue Plan funding because they really do deal with um, just normal transitions uh, to new settings. So I would just like you to know that just because it's uh, presented as a one year grant, there is the possibility of adapting for more normal times, which hopefully we will get to those sometime soon. Um, next slide, please. So the curriculum details are these. We have um, two opportunities uh, available. So at the early childhood space, and I will say at this time, um, most of the early childhood slots have been filled. Um, school districts have taken them, but I, I, Patty and Kayport and I thought it would be a good idea to come and present anyway, even though it looks like there's a wait list at this time. Um, because there is the possibility for us to access uh, additional funding. Um, we haven't secured it yet, but we have a lot of high hopes that we have some supporters that would be interested in expanding opportunities. So I will tell you about the opportunity anyway um, and ask you for to contact me later if you have interest so that we can kind of gauge the degree or the extent of additional funding that, that we would need to be looking for to make the opportunities available. Um, in the early childhood area, um, the, the program is really focused on our animal ambassadors. So we will assign an animal ambassador. At this time, it's most likely going to be our Chilean guinea pig. <laughs> um, and that will be the protagonist of the program. Um, but the the contrivance of the program is that our our animal ambassador is placed into a new setting, in this case, a zoo. Um, and week by week or session by session, um, that animal ambassador encounters a dilemma related to the transition. Um, you know, feeling scared might be an example or not really knowing how to sit still at those times in the day when she's asked to sit still um, and just encountering new other animal friends for the first time and not knowing how to talk to them or seeing that they look a little bit different and not being sure if, if it, it's a friendly friend or <laughs> an unfriendly friend and sort of the, the purpose of each uh, session is to help give the kids some strategies or ideas for how to navigate those kinds of dilemmas um, that they encounter when they move from their homes and their families to the broader world. Um, at each session, which are about an hour, slotted to be an hour, about an hour each, our zoo educator um, comes to your classroom, uh, tells a story to the kids that sort of describes the dilemma and the resolution of the dilemma and that resolution relates to building a social emotional competency um, that our Ohio uh, learning standard aligned. Um, after the story, there the kids get an opportunity to have a meet and greet with various zoo animals. So while we do have one animal protagonist, other animals are also involved. So you know there might be one or two or three animals present in the classroom for the kids to get to experience and meet and observe, um, and in most cases touch uh, as well. Um, and then at the, you know, the last portion of the session is um, a hands-on activity, which tends to be really play-based um, for the kids to practice the social emotional les lesson that was featured in that 
in that story or that session. Um, the second opportunity that we have adapts a, uh, a program, a, a STEM focused program actually, that is geared to sort of the intermediate grades. So we're thinking fourth or fifth grade would be appropriate for this. Um, we run this program in Summit with some Summit County schools and that's the grades. They actually span fourth through sixth grade in this particular program. But um, students in this program, they build, um, the, the purpose is to build team working skills um, through a different hands-on activity that's completed each session. In the STEM situation, um, those kinds of, the, the SEL component really has to do with the fact that STEM itself as a field is extremely collaborative and you need to be able to work with others, communicate with others, solve conflicts with others, present your ideas to others. Um, but what we understood is that those kinds of skills also translate to the peer relationships that can be difficult you know, for this, this age range, especially the fifth grade when seems from my own experience, that's when there's a lot of relationship shifts. Um, and so we made the adaptation to really focus on thinking about how um, to help kids strengthen uh, their, their relationships with peers. Um, so during this particular opportunity, our hands-on activities will alternate um, SEL themes and science learning, so sort of like the team teamwork that's involved in science projects, to engage um, to engage the kids that are participating both in peer relationships, so learning how to be good to each other, as well as learning how to work together academically. Um, and so, an example of a more science focus one activity that we do the kids um, work in groups and have assigned roles that they get to practice. They get to practice each role um, in the group and they're tasked with something like building um, an animal tail on a weighted sock or something that they actually can make um, that can be weight bearing. So they really have to think through um, some of the science as well as how are we going to work together, who's going to do what, and um, how are we going to understand the project, what are the project management tasks, all of that kind of thing. So that might extend or um, translate to an academic kind of uh, skill set. And the peer relationship um, aspect of it, we are aligning with um, Random Acts of Kindness Foundation, which is um, affiliated or approved by CASEL, which is you know the social emotional learning pr provider for Ohio, from what I understand. And um, they have some really great, we think, uh, hands-on kind of exercises for kids to um, work together to think about to, and create a finished product that gets them really thinking about um, social emotional competencies or skills, like what inclusion means. So one really interesting one was um, asking the kids together to um, build an acrostic with the you know inclusion letters and you know we would ask the, the kids to um come up with their acrostic do decorations together so there would still be the team building act uh aspect of it um and group work but it also gets them thinking about well what does inclusion really mean that's just one one example um of activities that we would do but there there are many others and that's a six week program um next slide please so the session details are this, early childhood, as I said, um, four sessions of one hour duration, and we would be able to schedule to fit into your teacher's schedule. Um, we would schedule directly with your school. Um, and the, the idea would be to include the whole classroom at whatever grade level you were focused on. And for the intermediate grade program, that is a six session program of one hour duration. It could be scheduled in class or after school. And our, um, our max for that one would be up to 30 students. Uh, and there are going to be two rounds. There's currently, we are, you know, we're expecting to start our winter round um, by the end of January or early February. 
and there is also going to be a round uh, introduced in the fall. Um, as I said, early childhood appears to be closed at this time, and unless we can quickly uh, secure new funding. Um, but fall, you know, for to introduce it in the fall would still be an option um, for you. And our intermediate grades, we're looking for uh, one more school to work on that, um, on it, to adopt that program. So I thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, um, we can do it now. Or if you would like to contact me later, my contact information is, is um, on the slide. And just the last thing to mention is there are other Akron Zoo opportunities um, and you can click on those links if you're interested in thinking about a field trip, um, any custom classroom sessions or any virtual sessions that the zoo offers. Michelle, Thank Michelle. you, Michelle. And I see that Anna, our Louisville um, champion, has asked a question about would the zoo consider summer programming for summer enrichment programs? Yes, definitely. Or do you mean something so uh, like on the same theme offered in the summer or something different? We, we most definitely um, do have the ability to offer summer sessions. Um, and would be interested in continuing this. Uh, you know, like I said, we we anticipate that while this was created in the moment of the pandemic, that this will persist well beyond. So we would love to get it regularized um, year round if that is a help to school districts for sure. So um, please contact me and we can talk through your thoughts a little bit more uh, and we can I can speak with my team and uh, get to know what it would take to schedule in the summer. Michelle, it appears that it appears that Anna will be contacting you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sounds good. I will look forward to uh, talking with you. <coughs> All right, thank you so much. Yeah, and it looks like uh, it looks like Dana is uh, also sharing that she would like to see it for Marlington summer migrant program. So she wants to be on the second on the list behind Deanna. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank I, uh, you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us and for just going out of your way as a zoo to uh, to Wright Stark County into, into your vision and funding. So we appreciate that. It just brings just more hopeful, more fun activities. I have two-year-old uh, granddaughters and I just think they would love to be a part of those those courses with the animals so thank you so much good thank um, you uh and this is not as much of a fun topic in the prevention world but it's an important topic this is another hot off the press that came uh, that came from uh, to us out of stanford's lab um, but it just happens to be a free online self-paced course for your students. If you're needing an alternative to suspension, or if you just have students that are, are wanting um, and voicing that they want to quit, but they're having some trouble, um, it's, it's just one of many um, options that are out there around vaping prevention as well as vaping intervention. Um, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention because that just came out. It was um, promoted by the Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services just this past week as well. Um, so, and I also have, there is a, a link there on our Stark County ESC, our prevention website. There is, um, I do have a, a bunch of other options that, that are out there around vaping um, that you can be looking through and thinking through um, for, for your students. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out um, if I can be of assistance further around the, the vaping um, world that we, we seem to have. We need to help our, our young people get their lungs as healthy as possible, especially um, with what we have before us with COVID. So next slide, please. I know that this year continues to be a struggle. Um, and so don't hesitate to reach out to me or KPORT as needed for resources or strategies to support your staff and your student wellness. We work behind the scenes. If we wanna just make sure we individualize what you need, there are significant resources and strategies that are out there um, for a lot of different topics and be happy to just individualize the, the support um, 
you need. So don't hesitate to reach out by email or phone as you need, and we'll continue to help you as needed. But thank you for all you do. I uh, continue to, to say every day, you are our heroes. You're right there next to the nurses out there. So thank you. Thank you, Patty. And thank you to your team for all that you're doing to support our districts um, in this region in Greater Stark County. And um, again, thank you to Michelle also from Akron Zoo for sharing that information. Very important for us as we look ahead to the future. Um, as we are getting ready to move into now some of our updates for the curriculum department, I wanted to make you aware of an opportunity that I mentioned at the November ILC meeting, which is the ACT mini session. We finally have a date on the calendar. It's January 21st. Um, it's going to be a virtual session hosted by ACT. Victoria, Victoria uh, Thompson Campbell will be the facilitator of that session. If you're interested, uh, the registration link is included. You'll need to register by January 17th. After registration, you will receive uh, later on a link to a Microsoft team meeting that she will be hosting. Uh, the two topics that will be covered from 9 to 1130 will be moving from static to dynamic data and making the most of ACT educator, student and parent resources. If you're wondering who should attend from your district, because I know every district has different personnel that are involved in some of those conversations, you may want to check out the, dis, uh, the session descriptions that are located um, with that link there, and that may provide you with more information as to who should attend. But just wanted to get you up to speed on that, um, on that date that is now firm, January 21st. All right. We're going to go ahead and transition now to um, some of our curriculum team updates. We're going to lead off with uh, Matthew Mays and technology. All right. Thank you. Um, for uh, those of you who have attended in the past, OETC is coming up again uh, here in February. Um, they are still virtual this year, um, but what they did was they made it much more concise. So if you attended last year, you know that it kind of, for lack of a better word, kind of went on and on and on for uh, the course of the month. Um, this year they have truncated that, and so now it uh, just takes place over the course of four days, um, which is really nice. So um, one other thing I wanted to mention, the early bird pricing was set to end tomorrow, um, but they have extended that for another week. So if uh, you're interested in attending or sending people from your district um, to that virtual conference, um, definitely make sure that you check out that link um, at oetc.ohio.gov. And then on behalf of many people here uh, at uh, the ESC, I wanted to pass along uh, something that's kind of happening in the background. So we definitely know uh, the struggle that's happening within uh, our school districts and um, our team here wanted to do something to try and help. And so um, we have set up this website. Um, it's workforcestarkschools.org. Um, the idea here is that people throughout our community um, you know, can go <coughs> onto this website, can alert <coughs> us of um, services that they can provide to your districts and then um, we can kind of help connect those dots for you. So um, if you know me, then you also know that my wife is incredible. Um, she's the best person in the world and she helped put uh, these billboards together. So uh, today, as you're making your way out, uh, if you're uh, here in this room, you may start to uh, see some of these billboards pop up throughout our entire county. So um, it's, like I said, it's a, it's a big push, um, but the reason why I'm bringing it up here is that there's a link um, for a bunch of promotional materials that I've put together. So if, um, let's say that there's uh, you know, a program that uh, is handed out at uh, basketball games, at winter sports, you know, throughout the spring, um, maybe newsletters that go out through um, you know, your schools, um, whatever that may be, please by all means feel free to um, grab those promotional materials, uh, you know, put those up uh, throughout your building. The idea here is that we're kind of all in this together, right? So, um, you know, just because a person, uh, you know, maybe a mechanic, let's say, within my district, they can jump on, um, maybe they live in Perry Township, but that's something that Jackson is really in need of. Um, we're really just trying to help everybody, trying to collaborate on that, um, and uh, just trying to get all of our districts the resources that, uh, the human resources that uh, you might be needing. So, I'm really happy to be a part of that. And um, like I said, be on the lookout for those billboards, and we really appreciate your help getting that information out with those other promotional materials. So 
Thank you very much. And same with that. My good buddy Tom uh, is going to take over with some uh, evaluation data and CCP update. All right, just some real quick information on the next slide. You'll see uh, information I've shared via emails. We have an evaluation support website where I keep dropping in as many documents that we could find that assist you, including the edible rubric that um, hopefully has been helpful. Um, it's a whole folder, so whatever form you need. And then we are starting a data uh, support website also. And it's basically just a way to, you know, big giant Google folders, but easy to find. And currently in there, I have the information with the value added. I had those three initial videos that I, um, I made to help support you guys. And then I have another five videos and they're all very short. I think the longest one's 14 minutes. I suggest you listen at one and a half speed. I sound really good then. Uh, and so they're even shorter if you look at it that way. We are kind of building that as we go. So there will be more and more information in there. You know, a lot of uh, what you guys know what Brian does and are always waiting to see his stuff. That will be in there also. So check out those two. That you could also find them on our curriculum website. And then the last piece of information, go ahead, Matt, is on the uh, CCP grant that Kent State was using. Um, we just got word <coughs> last week that ODE has allowed them to extend it for um, another year. So talking to Dr. Bathy yesterday, he has about 14 slots left for any of your educators that are interested in becoming CCP credential between for math, poli-sci, and communication studies. I know some of you have had people go through them. I, I know that there have been some uh, roadblocks. These three have the classes set. The math is completely online. There are six classes that come out of their master's program. Uh, the poli-sci and the communications kind of have some online some face to face. I will be sending you an email to all the curriculum directors on the curriculum director list with the information. I am not pushing it out to the teachers. I'll allow you guys to make those decisions within your districts. All communications will be with Dr. Bathy. And because we just found out, including him, uh, everything, the registration needs to be completed as close to January 12th as possible. But if you have a teacher that is interested in covering the class, the classes will be covered, the textbooks will be covered, the registration fees will be covered. Um, the contact person is Dr. Bathy. And again, that's all in the information that I'm going to push out later today. I didn't want to just send it without giving, you know, I knew I was going to see everybody today. So, Tom, yes. There's oh, well, there's a question on the chat too. Go ahead and go ahead, Dave. Real quickly, how long would they have to complete the coursework? A year? Or so basically, it needs to be through the grant covers them through summer 23. Okay. Now, again, if you have a teacher that doesn't finish, the grant is still covering them. And then if they have to pick up the class themselves later on, <coughs> I know it's difficult. It's just, you know, it's many of us paid for our masters or for those classes. And, this is free, so it kind of makes it nice. Matt, you just said. Yeah, so Monica Myers had a question in the chat. She says, Tom, do we know what communication courses they would be approved to teach? So the communication courses that they're going to be approved to teach, that again is an individual university decision. Um, I know that Kent State has worked a couple different times with Stark State. So I, can't, I don't want to answer that with saying exactly which ones because it is each department chair's choice and we've even seen some changes over the years. So um, Monica or anybody, I would really reach out to Bathy and get his word so that you have it coming from that university on uh, what they could, what could, they could use. Any other questions? All right, great, thanks. 
Hi there. I'll just sit from here and wave to people. Um, this time I really can say the word. Hi, Dave. This time I really can say the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And hands up, how many actually sang it when I said it? You were an old Mary Poppins, right? Um, so that is one of the longest words. So I, each month we'll have a new one. Um, I am on the ODE Gifted Advisory Council and was luckily. I don't know if that's the right word, um, chosen to be on the subgroup uh, committee to work on the gifted report card changes. The good news is, is that I sort of am hearing things um, of what's coming. Nothing is official yet. It will be sent to the board later this month, and we all know that things don't always go through the board like they start. So everything I say is with a grain of salt. Um, but just know the trend that's headed there. Um, first of all, value added will remain the same, even though it won't be a C, it will be the stars, it'll be in that same range. And by the way, it is in law that we still have to pass the three parts. We're the only one that has to have the three parts. You have to have all three parts. It's in law. Um, the only thing is it is moving to the gap closing section. All right. The gifted PI is, has been a huge topic of conversation. <coughs> As you know, right now, it's, it, that's performance index. Um, you have to, I have those numbers backwards. That should be a 117, okay? And that is currently, that number is 97.5% of the top number, which is 120. Um, As you know, the PI is changing. It's going to be the top 2% of the state, so that will be a, uh, a changing number every year. In other words, next year it could be 120, the year after that it could be 118. Um, they did that because of COVID, but every year that number will change. So we are looking at doing that for gifted as well. So whatever the number is for the state, that will be the number for gifted, that top number. What they will do, if you remember way back, if you're really old like me, you know that they, um, we eased into the 117, there was a 114 and then et cetera. So for next year, we will have, um, if this passes, again, grain of salt, it will be 95% of whatever that top number is. The year after that, it will be 96.5% of whatever that number is. And the year after that, it will be 97.5 of whatever that number is that year. So it, I think it makes sense. I think it will help us when we have a year like COVID where our numbers are down. I think that will help us all. Um, questions on that one, and I apologize for flipping the numbers. Just the math guy in me says, why not 96.25 that second year, which is halfway point. Well, you know what? You can be on our committee because they've actually floated that around. And what they did was they created a huge chart that showed how many districts would make it with each of the percentages. And they felt that if they made it much lower than 95, I'll start there, there'd be too many that would make it. And then, so then I, I don't know why 97.5 is more than that. But that doesn't really answer it. I don't know that you didn't make it. No, that would be Matt, do you have another question? No, we flipped it on the slide. So oh, thank Brian, you. Yeah, Brian flipped it thank on the slide and I refreshed it. Okay, so it's right now. All right, the harder one, if that sounded weird, the next one, the input points is a much longer conversation. Input points, remember, we needed 80. Um, I always, this is a Diane thing. Um, I've always felt that it's a game. You can get the 80 points pretty easily. You just say you're doing things and whatever. They are taking it more seriously. They're also looking at changing some things. So I can tell you that they will be basing it on identification, service, <coughs> and then they will be looking at um, how well you identify and serve um, minority populations and the underrepresented. Um, and the socioeconomic numbers. What they are changing is, is because if you remember, Elaine Barkin and I have been very adamant that there are some districts that could never get points. Because if you didn't have 10 of a group, there's no way you could get those points. It was not proportional. 
They are now making it involved with a representation index. I hope I'm saying that correctly. So that if you only have five kids, you can still, your percentage will be based on those five kids. You're not just losing points. We may see a number change. They, um, um, that is still being worked out. We've had, I don't know how many meetings. Um, if you've done an ODE meeting, you're not allowed to do a virtual meeting, but you can call in by phone, which is very frustrating. So I only hear about every seventh word um, on a phone meeting, so it's very frustrating. But again, that should be finalized by the end of this month. So questions on that? It's just something to think about. Again, it will also be transitioned. <coughs> they will also change the numbers so that it will be something we work up to. And I can't tell you, right now they're looking at either 120 points or 140 points. So that will change. Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah. No? Okay. So they're going to start awarding points the way Drew Carey does. I mean, 120, 140 is a huge jump from 80. Right. So it they'll, was, cha oh, they'll okay. change some of the points yes. values. What they're going, yes, yeah. what they're going to do is they're going to break it apart so that you're not just getting identification and service. You'll get them by grade bands, but they're also breaking those grade bands up. So it'll be, you still get the most points for K to two, but they'll also be a three to six, I believe, a seven to nine, and then a high school track. I don't know if that's the right word, but. So yes, and then you'll get, I don't think anybody will lose out. If you've made the points before, I think you still will. I don't think in our area we'll have any trouble with it. Our biggest problem were districts that didn't have enough kids for the um, the low socioeconomic and the minorities, and I think that will help us. Okay, um, if you could go to the next slide. The gifted budget, I, I just put this as the same slide that I used back in the fall that tells you how much you're supposed to be getting. I know Mike can't find where it is. Did you find it? Joyce, I'm going to find it. Look me up. Okay, so you're good, because I was going to say don't ask me, so that's good. Um, the monies are there, we think. I see a lot of heads shaking. That's good. They're pretty substantial. Um, I, the, there are a lot of questions that people are asking me, and I sent this out yesterday. I can give you Diane answers, but they're not necessarily ODE answers. ODE is creating a fact sheet that should be out. She said this week, I actually got an email answer. It was supposed to be out in December. Then they said January. Now they're saying this week. So we'll see, um, but I know there are lots and lots and lots of questions on how to use this money. I also know we didn't know about it till January, so to use some of these amounts from now to May is, is crazy. So write your questions down. I would send them to ODE, one of the gifted consultants. I think the more we send them questions, they'll realize they need to get that back paper out. So this is again just a you know, what, what's coming, and if you start doing the multiplying, I can't do that for you because I don't know your state share. But if you do that, you will see it will add up to quite a, a bit. So it, any questions on that except where to find it? All right. And I, if I hear a word that it's on, I will make sure the FAQ, I will, I will um, share that with everyone. All right, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Next up, Dana. Okay, so um, this first item you're going to want to share with your testing coordinators or whoever organizes the English language assessments <coughs> in your district. Um, the window opens up January 31st, so that's a little bit earlier than we um, typically open, uh, and it goes through March 25th. There are some new features. Uh, the manuals, the test coordinators manuals and the test administrator manuals, which those are direct links to, they have new appendices and in those appendices they have different checklists. So a checklist for a test administrator, a checklist for a test coordinator, uh, just different things that you need to go through. Also new this year is that they have test directions, directions only, in Arabic, Somali, and Spanish. And those are in script as well as a recording. So if you have somebody who can't read Arabic, for example, then you can play that script for the students. Uh, so that is new this year. And then some of those new features they're going to be talking about on a webinar next week. I put a registration link to that webinar that OD is doing 
on the administration for OALPA. Uh, last year, new, we were, because of our situation, we were allowed to administer the speaking portion in groups, but they had to be very spread out and um, because the speaking is one-on-one, -on -one, the student speaks into the microphone, into the computer. If there's any other outside noises, it won't read it and it will be a did not attempt. But because there weren't too many issues last year, they're allowing that again this year. But if there are other noises that are picked up, they'll cancel it. So make sure that if you're doing that, um, that you have the kids spread out in a large room so that it's not picking up other sounds. Uh, so so that, that was kind of good. And that's on page nine in the manual if you wanted to look at that there. Uh, the other thing I want to remind you about the OELPA is please use as many staff members other than your EL teachers as possible to administer the test. It's four separate tests and it's very time consuming for the TESOL teachers and that's a lot of instruction time lost with the English learners. Uh, so we want to get them as much instruction as possible, so please utilize whoever else you have on staff that uh, is administering tests. So that information's there. Um, also, as I've shared before, we do have extended ELP standards for those English learners who also have significant cognitive disabilities. And uh, so those are on ODE's site. That's a link to those extended standards. Next year, we'll have an alt OELPA test. This year, we do have a few districts who are participating in the pilot for their students who are duly identified. Please note that those students will also still have to take the OELPA because the alt OELPA is just a pilot this year, and those scores do not count. Uh, and so they'll still have to take the OELPA, and that's going to be happening in March and February. But take a look at those extended standards, get your teachers used to using those. And then uh, lastly, uh, just an announcement, and this has already gone out to all your school psychs and your EL staff and your districts. Next Friday, we are continuing, uh, this is year three of a series that Terrell Schwick and I have been doing, SST9 and ESC, um, for distinguishing language difference from disability. So we have had Steve Gill come do trainings on 16 data points that are needed to collect to determine if you get to that ETR position. We've had Dr. Samuel Ortiz in about culturally and linguistically appropriate assessments. Now, year three here, we have a bilingual psychologist from Summit County who is going to be speaking with us about how she uses those tools. So now a practitioner, a local practitioner, how she uses those tools in making decisions to distinguish language difference from disability. And so she's uh, gonna be with us on the 14th and that's a link to the flyer with registration. You can register for morning only or all day. You can't do the afternoon only. And it's gonna be a hybrid situation um, as well. We'll be in this room. And um, participants do not need to have attended the past two years of training. So if you have new staff, they can participate. But I highly encourage your teams, because each of our districts sent teams to those trainings. Um, I recommend that you have those teams participate. Thank you. All right, next up, we're going to head into a break, a 10 minute break. So feel free to get some coffee. Those of you that are joining us online, this is your time to get your coffee and we'll see you in 10 minutes. We do have one update. Diane would like to provide a quick update for you regarding, uh, if, if, you, if you noticed I skipped the second bullet there about webinars on January 12th and 19th. That was an awesome, I was really looking forward to an opportunity where we were gonna have a virtual meetup and we were going to do it together upstairs uh, with the authors of Teaching for Deeper Learning. Right before I started, they canceled. So that is not happening. So I just wanted, I, did, I mean, I did skip it, but that, just so you know, it's not happening. I've asked them to let us know if it, if it um, is rescheduled. So thank you. Brian. All right. No more break. We don't need another update. Um, so welcome back, guys. Happy New Year. Um, 
Today I wanted to kind of talk to you guys about um, some OST and e EOC updates. Um, the first being, right before we went on break, the third grade um, fall uh, reading uh, test results came out. So the first thing that we wanted to do is I wanted to get out to you guys um, just a way for you to uh, share your results on that. Um, and with that, the link that you see there, I shared that with the curriculum directors. So um, if you're somebody in a district and you need access to that, uh, your curriculum director can share that with you. Um, and then what you'll see when you actually click on that is uh, fall 19, the fall 20. Those results are already in there, so you won't have to um, add those ones. Those will be in there for you. Um, now, to make this process a little easier is now that we're in the uh, centralized reporting system, we just kind of wanted to walk you through that a little bit. Um, I know some of you guys have been in there. Um, I know some of you, it's still a little new to you, and you might be a little hesitant in there. So we just kind of wanted to walk through some of the pieces to this. We are in the process of, our, I'm in the process of putting together a video, um, a couple of videos actually, um, that will guide you through that. So if you want to share those with uh, people that are using that centralized reporting system, um, you'll be able to see that. So. Ryan, are we supposed to put our percent in there for you? Yeah, if you want to go ahead and put your percent in there. Um, those first two columns, Anna, should be filled out. Yep. And then um, it's just that uh, the new column, if you guys want to put your data in there, that will really help out. Okay. So first, how do we get to the centralized reporting system? Um, if you go to the Ohio Assessments portal here, so uh, oh.portal.com, cambiumast.com, click on that link, it'll bring you to this page, which I think we're all very familiar with, um, whether we use the Restart Readiness or the Ohio State Test. Uh, from there, if you click on, oops, if you click on right here where it says Ohio State Test, uh, you'll go to the next page, and then you'll have to scroll down. So what we're going to click on is where it says teachers and test administrators. So if you scroll to the bottom of that page, um, that's where you will find that. Um, from here, you'll click on the centralized reporting system. Uh, now, the one thing that I want to make a point to you as well is right below that, the online reporting system, um, we sent out earlier um, after our last ILC that they opened that up temporarily so that you could pull out the old item analysis reports if you needed those. Um, that is open until next Friday. So um, if you haven't had a chance to get in there and pull anything out that you'd like to, um, now's the time to do that. So uh, you'll want to get out any of those old item analysis because they're not going to create that report like that in the future. So I'm kind of I'm working on a workaround to that. Um, but we'll kind of talk about that and see if that's something that you need there. So centralized reporting system is where we'll go next. Okay. You'll log in, uh, email, password, and then you'll select a role. Now, one of the things that I want to tell you guys about these roles is they change the access to this. So a lot of our teachers, um, we assign them a TE role. And I know there was kind of a uh, confusion when they first um, put that out there. So we started as TA, and then you had to switch them over to a TE so they could see data. Um, the role there um, with the TE is TE is only going to be able to see data um, of students that are in their roster. Okay. Now, um, with that, let me say this. As a district, I know some of our districts, instead of linking it to a teacher, they might link it to the principal. Okay. If, when in, if you do that or when you do that, the teacher won't be able to go in and see their own data there. And so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so uh, the reason that I tell you that is I know many of you we have shared with me an access as a TE so that I can go in and build reports and create reports for you. I don't think that's going to work anymore um, unless you add a roster for me of these are all the students. Um, the other thing that's optional there is if we change my role to a building reports user uh, or a district reports user, 
those will give, I believe, the access that we would need to pull the report and create those things for you or help you out with that data. Um, so if at any point you guys have any questions on that or you need help putting something together, please just email me, call me, and we'll kind of talk through what we need to do um, for me to have access to that. Okay. Um, so ordinarily when a teacher would go in here, they're just going to select their role. They'll probably only have one role there. It'll be PE. Um, and then most people don't have a, a large amount of roles, but um, we can select the role. Okay. When you do that, um, right now my screen's kind of messy and I did that as on purpose because this is what it will look like at the end of the year. You're going to have your OST results in there, you're going to have your benchmarks in there, you're going to have your check mark, or checkpoints in there, you're going to have your OLP results in there, you're going to have your OLPs results in there, and alternate assessment in there as well, I believe. So I think I hit all of them. So you're going to have a bunch of tiles, and you can see for the OST, we have one for each subject area. If you were to go in there right now, you're probably only going to see your OLPs, um, and you're probably going to see your ELA test, because that's all that we have right now for this year. Um, so the one thing that I want to bring to your attention is when we get to the end of the year, this little snapshot here, this is actually going to be all of your grades combined. So this is going to be math in general, and it'll break it down by the percent that score at each level. Um, so we have our limited basic um, and on through. Um, Dana, I know for our EL folks, that scale, I think there's only three emerging. Um, and it's, I'm drawing emerging, a progressing, and proficient. Yeah, so you're going to just have those three, So and they'll have a scale next to it that you can click on um, if you're not familiar, but you're, the people accessing that probably are. All right, now. How do we get to our actual results? Um, for ELA, if you only have third grade in there right now, you can count up the advanced, the accelerated, and the proficient, add them together, get your percent there, uh, because there's only one in there right now. Um, if I want to get in and just look at one subject at a time, because I have multiple, what I'll do is I'll find the tile that I want. So let's say I want the ELA test. I'll click on that. And actually, this is math here. Um, and then once I click on, I can either click on the uh, link here or the magnifying glass. They actually both do the same thing. Um, you'll get a sheet that comes up, and it will have all of the different tests. So if you're clicking on the ELA one right now, you're only going to have grade three English language arts. It's only one option because that's the only test that we've had. Um, Brian, I have a question here sure. from Becky. Yes. Um, she said, Brian, please remind me the difference of data in EVOS and the CRS. Okay, so EVOS is going to be your value added data. Um, so that's comparing, and, and there won't be EVOS data for this test right here. It'll come out um, that the results comparing, well, for third grade, there isn't EVOS results, but when we take our spring test, it'll compare it to their previous test. Um, that will come out next fall um, for this year's data. This is the actual how they did on the test. So we'll see how they did on their um, end of course test, their OST test for three through eight, the actual proficient, basic, limited, that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. And Brian, not to vote, would you find your item analysis in this or is that still in? Yes. Um, so you will find an item analysis in this, which I love. I think is great. Um, it does more. Um, but the item analysis that we used to use, they, they didn't carry that over. So it's going to look different. Um, but I created something that's going to make it so that we can still have that item analysis if that's something that's useful and helpful to you. OK. Um, so. If we're looking at third grade, let's pretend this is English language arts. Um, we can go ahead and click on this right here, and we'll zoom in. And what we'll notice is on this page, we can see the state, we can see the district, we can see the school. District and school a lot of times may be the same, but if you're elementary and you have 
two or three different elementaries, you know, that your district could be different from your school, or if you're like a subject like algebra where you're taking it at the middle school and the high school, those could get, um, be a little bit different. We'll then see rosters here. So if it's a teacher, they're probably only going to see their roster. If you're district personnel, you'll be able to click on individual rosters to see actual individual students there. Um, one of the things that I recommend when I'm looking at this, especially if you're a teacher, is right here it says standard keys. If I click on that, above each question, it's going to tell you the exact standard that that is. So I think that really helps me as I'm looking at it. I think it'll help your teachers looking at it as well. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. It's going to be visible on an upcoming tab. Okay. So this is math. Um, what I feel the most comfortable, and so we have, what we start out here is we can break this down. Sorry, one thing I forgot to tell you. Oops, let me go back. Um, right here is where you'll see percent proficient. So um, as you're looking at your third grade, if you're in there right now, you can see for your district, this is the percent proficient. Um, again, this is just made up data, so this is not real, uh, a real district. Um, so Anna, that percent that we talked about to put into the chart, that this right here is where you could find the exact number. Okay. Okay. Um, now, as far as these uh, little tabs here, they all expand out. And what happens first is we're going to have the five questions we did the best on, the five items we performed the worst on, and then we're going to have all of the reporting categories that we normally see our item analysis broken down into. And um, one other option here is you can break this down a little bit differently as well. So up here where it says breakdown, um, if you want to see just a comparison between males and females on this test, you can click gender and it will split it out and you can see that you can do rates and roll grade. Uh, that might be helpful if you're looking at like an algebra where multiple different grade levels may be taking that test. Um, and then migrant students, um, that's all that I have on mine that I see. So um, as you get into yours, you may see some different things. But I think right now those are the main ones that you'll see. So um, you can let me know if you have different options there. Um, but that's what I'm seeing when I do it. Okay, which is kind of nice to be able to break it down a little bit. And just a reminder that migrant student is different from immigrant student or different from EL student. So it's very specific identification from OMEC, Ohio Migrant Education Center. Thanks, Dan. All right, so let's go ahead and open one of these up. Um, so when you open them up, so here's the five best and the five worst. Uh, and I'm going to skip over that because uh, a lot of times you might find that they're tied for the same amount there. Um, so. We'll just skip over those and we'll go to an actual thing. So right here I can see that this is functions. Um, so we're still in that math one, um, but uh, reading literary text, if you're looking at your third grade, might be the first one that you see there. Um, you still have your state, your district, your school. And then down here where it says my students, you'll start to see individual students listed. Okay. Um, this is telling you that functions, question four, was the first question over functions on that test. This right here, because I click, click that um, indicator tab, I slid it over, it's telling me what indicator this is. It's 8F2, and I can see how many points that's worth. <coughs> now, this is the average that the state did out of one point. It was a point four nine, so we're pretty close to half of them getting it right. District. Again, this is fake data, but we have ones all the way down, and we only have one fake student here, and they got that question right. Um, so uh, we can see how many points they got on that. So you can see every single student, how they did on each question. Now, these numbers right here, where you see the link, if there's an actual link there, and for the fall ones, you're not going to see any, that link means that it is a released question. You can click on it. You can see the actual question, and you can actually see what they responded to that question. So I think that's going to be super helpful. Um, now, not all the questions are released, and I'm not sure how that's actually going to work, because usually we have to wait until 
much later in the summer for those questions to be released. So when we do see that in the spring, will, will they be linked right away? Will the process be faster this year? I'm really not sure how that all play out. But as of right now, when you look at your ELA fall, which normally there are no release questions from, you're not going to see any of them linked. This will be helpful if you're doing a benchmark, though. So one of the things I want to say, you'll notice that there's a link here and a link here. This will just show you, if you click on the link at the top, that's just going to show you the question. Right? It won't show you how the student answered. If you click on your student score here, which has a link, that will actually show you what your student entered there. So if it is a multiple response question, which I know a lot of teachers say, It'd be nice if I could see what they answered. If it was released in its link, you can click on there and you can see, oh, they were supposed to click three to get this question correct. They only clicked two or something like that. So you'll have a better understanding of what they got wrong on each question. Um, and that is available on the benchmark um, and the checkpoint uh, now. Okay. So I kind of wiped this one out. It's just a sample here. So when you actually get into the questions, um, you don't have to keep going back out. If you want to stick with a single student, you can just click over to get to his next question um, and, and keep going through that way. If you want to look at all the number fours and you just want to change to the next student, there's a little drop down menu right here that if you click it, you can select the next student that you want to look at. All right. And then this would be an example where you can see um, exactly what they picked. Um, and then up here, sorry, I meant to mention this. This is going to tell you where, right at the top, you'll see is what they were expecting the student to answer. So if it's a multiple tool, if it's a multiple selection one, they'll tell you all of the ones that they were expecting. All right, now, let's talk about printing some results here. So um, for printing, um, that there's a process that we'll go through here. So there's a couple different ways. Um, I, I should say that about pretty much everything in this system, there is multiple ways to get to all of the different things. So we're just starting with a very basic view here. Um, and so if you want to download those student results, um, we're going to go to right here where it says download student results. Um, a page that looks like this will come up. And we'll select the test that we want. Click next. We'll select the subject that we want. So I'm going to click ELA here. And then we'll have a choice to do all students. Um, and you can see that uh, I might have multiple rosters here. If you want to just click one teacher's roster, you could do that. A bunch of different options here. So if you're a single teacher, obviously you're not going to have multiple rosters. You'll just have your own. Okay? And then when you hit next, Okay. Uh, you'll have some options over here in a gray box. So if you want to print the report, like the, the nice shiny glossy report that gets sent home at the beginning of the year, um, and I guess for third grade we'll get those as well, um, you can click here, um, you can click individual student report, um, you can do single PDF or multiple if you want one for the entire class. Um, there's a simple and a detailed. So on those, there's a little bit more information on the second one. Um, it gives the item analysis um, breakdown of how the student did on each question, that sort of thing. Um, there's a couple additional graphs. So feel free to play with it, see which one you like more. Um, but that's an option. Dana, you're going to love this one right here. Um, I can click and change the language there. Yes. Um, so if I do have, need to send it home to a Spanish-speaking family, I can change that language, print it off for them, and send that version home. Okay. So, uh, so just, to, just to clarify that, so, so when we're sending communications home, we are required to send communications in a language that the parents can understand. So that's important for all districts to know so that you can send that information in their language. Is it just Spanish, or what other languages are there? Let me check that in a second, okay? Um, so I know that you can change it. Um, it's been a while since I put that slide together. Denise, I, so I think I'll, that they have many options. I yeah. think it's like a Google tool that they're okay. using. All right. Um, 
Then, if you're looking for the old spreadsheet that we used to get when we went into the ORS that said student results, the way you could print that is if you go student data file, I always change it to CSV, but XLS will put it in Excel as well. Uh, and then a single file data, a single combined data file, that's going to put all your subjects together. We only have ELA right now, so we could really click that one. And we're just going to get the ELA results there. So you would have the, the names and all the other information that you would ordinarily get. It's the exact same report that we're used to seeing there. Okay. Um, one follow-up option then, um, and this is new, so this wasn't a, we didn't have this option before. If we go back to this screen when we clicked on and we had all the different ELA or all the different math subjects, you're going to notice that there's a little export button next to each test. If I click on that, it's going to take that's probably my best view. It's going to take this information, it's going to dump it into a spreadsheet. It looks ugly. It, it looks really ugly and messy and like things aren't lined up real well. Um, but it's going to basically expand out all those sections and you're going to be able to print out in Excel um, that whole page. So it's going to be a line for each student, so that part's nice. It's pretty easy to clean up, but it starts out and you're looking at it going, what the heck is going on here? So um, that being said, um, you do have that option and that's the option that I use or, or that I'm going to use for transferring this information to our old item analysis template. So um, what we can do is we can take those multiple year tracking like we've done. We can take this ex export that we got. I can dump that in there and, and then transfer it over. So um, that is, I'm going to work on some instructions for you. Um, if you're somebody who wants to do it on your own, that's fine. Um, if you're someone who uh, right now is like, oh my gosh, there's so much stuff to do. You want me to do it for you? I'm happy to put that together for you. But basically, I, I have most of it built. I've already worked on it for a couple of our districts, um, and we are we're, we're good. So like, it will work, um, and, and we'll put it together. We can send it out to you. So. <laughs> so I, I thought that it was something that like I miss not being able to see this is our percentage that had zero on this question one two three four um, so I missed that um, so I just we put that together so it'll tie in there we can dump it right in with what we <coughs> here as far as tracking those and we're all set here so if that's something that interests you just let me know um, and I can work on helping you put that together all right um, so that's all I have for today. Uh, if you guys have any questions before I sit down and hand it over to Amanda and Jen. I think the chat looks good, right? Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. several updates and I'm sure you've seen things coming through your inbox uh, over the last couple days so it started out with just a couple updates and expanded over the last couple days we'll try to make this as painless as possible because we know we've all been sitting for a long time um, the first couple things involve the test and you may have already seen this come through a couple days ago OEE has uh, indicated that practice test materials and that includes online practice test scoring guides and paper practice materials are being updated they're slated to be released by <coughs> January 17th so that's something that um, we can keep an eye out for they did say that the practice writing item instructions are being um, revised as well as the rubric so that they'll match the tests that our students will encounter this spring so that's another positive thing I did link to ODE's test coordinator page so you can see um, all of the information that they have there about that. They've also indicated that the fall 21 grade three ELA family reports will be um, available on January 24th for all of the, the kids who were reported on time. Um, family reports were not printed for students whose formal test booklets were returned late or uh, for students where there were some discrepancies. So those discrepancies would need to be resolved before you'd be able to access that test.
test booklet. Um, but they did indicate that you can access the CRS to print an individual student report for those students if they were just submitted late. So that's something to be aware of as well. Um, and Governor DeWine signed Senate Bill 229 on December 14th. And so there's an emergency clause that is now immediately in place for the third grade reading guarantee promotion. I just wanted to bring this to your attention if you haven't seen it yet. So regarding the retention criteria for this year, it sort of looks a lot like it has for the last couple years. Um, so no school district can retain a student in the third grade based solely on a student's academic performance and reading this year unless the principal and reading teacher in consultation with the student's parent or guardian agree that the student is reading below grade level and not prepared for fourth grade. Um, there are some additional information pieces here that I'm not going to read aloud to you, but they're here for you to look at later regarding parental consultation and promotion discussions and also um, notification of that remediation plan. But it really looks like it has the last couple of years. There's not anything really shocking here. Can I, add, can I just say something on that? So, so as you all know, like English learners um, have been prior to this bill and everything, they can be exempt from a, a retention if they've been in US schools three years or less. So that means if they started first grade, second grade or third grade, they can be exempt. But if they started in kindergarten, they can't because that's more than the three years. So something to consider with this bill is often those kindergartners aren't meeting the third grade guarantee requirements because of language acquisition still. Because this three year exemption doesn't match research that shows it takes longer than three years to attain the English language to be successful in schools without accommodations. So consider those kindergartners um, who came in at kindergarten who um, otherwise would not have met the, uh, the, the um, promotion um, qualifications, um, but they may not be meeting them now because of language acquisition. So just keep that in mind as you're looking at that set of students for this, this year. All right. Um, we also wanted to put in front of you information about the Ohio Literacy Academy live sessions for this year. There's a link here on the slide. You'll see that they are on Fridays every single time from 1 to 2 p.m. The good news is if you're not able to attend these lives, they'll be archived just like last year. So they will be available on demand as well. But they're a really great time <coughs> here. So the first one's um, January 14th, coming up soon, and it's about debunking myths about dyslexia and grade-based teaching methods. I'm really looking at the implications for system change. That will be a really timely one for us right now as we begin the work around our, our legislation. Um, we also have some topics here around the science of reading and English learners with a really <coughs> excellent speakers. Um, we have one coming up on intentional conversation and play in early childhood and uh, leading literacy and growing equity as well and really looking at how we can improve reading instruction for all students. So these are really great topics, really timely ones. We're really excited about this opportunity and hopefully this is something you can add to your professional development catalogs as well. We know that this isn't an ideal time for teachers to jump on and view these videos, but because they'll be recorded and archived, They'd be really great things to um, facilitate during your PD days as well if you feel like they meet your needs and fit with your, your one plans and your literacy plans. Amanda, yeah. where do you uh, register for these at? They actually are not requiring registration. Thank you for asking that. So that website for Literacy Academy Live, and Jen, you can jump in as well if I don't clarify this well enough. Um, they are going to have kind of a live streaming approach to this, and you'll just be able to access the link directly from ODE's website and jump right on to um, those trainings. So there's no registration required. I'm going to pass it off to Jen just for a moment to update you on the dyslexia legislation piece. Yes, so as most of us, if not all of us, already know, um, the, the next draft um, of the dyslexia guidebook was released on Monday. Um, please know, again, it's directly linked here for you, um, that the questionnaire for feedback will be open until January 19th. And January 19th is very intentional 
Um, it gives a week to really process and analyze the feedback before the committee meets again on January 25th. Okay. So um, please know, again, as we talk through this, um, we know that the committee was up against a very tight timeline in getting this guidebook out. And they were very, um, of course, first and foremost, prioritizing what needed to be in there based on the legislation, which we can all relate to and understand. So now we're at that healthy conversation place that we know what's in there has to be in there. But in reality, how do we make this usable and beneficial for everybody? Um, so please know that, again, a big piece of feedback when that first um, kind of draft of the draft came out was we really need to do a good job of differentiating between requirements right and recommendations so you know as at all levels of the system all stakeholders we all said that very loud and clear so the conversation right now which i think will continue to take place especially on january 25th with the committee um, is how do we do a better job of that, right? So what they're talking about right now, which if it comes to be, I think will be incredibly beneficial, is along with that release of the final guidebook, there will be a companion document, very short, like 10 to 12 page, that outlines very specifically what is required of this right. Okay, so like it'll be very specific and it'll be presented side by side on the website as companion documents. So we think that that'll be really helpful. Again, the way those early conversations are panning out, I know as I got to hear some things, I was like, yes, go that direction. Yes, go that direction, please. Like, that's what we need. And so from the systems level support side of things, we're encouraging the state literacy network, you know, that we're all a part of to say, okay, we need you to prioritize these requirements for everybody. These need to be tier one, universally accessible. This is where we need to go. And then that'll free all of us up, you know, as your additional layers of support to come alongside and really coach and provide support around those best practices. So we're hoping that that's kind of how this evolves to pan out the rest of the year. So hopefully that makes sense. But just, you know, continue to keep in mind how valuable your feedback is um, and that this guidebook is really just one component of the law. Hopefully you saw some of the changes that you suggested in your feedback reflected in some of the, the early revisions on this as well. For sure, yes. So again, the committee meets again on January 25th, and they really are hoping to submit for state board approval in March. Okay. Um, actually, I think I'll say one more thing here. If I could pick one thing for you as districts to prioritize <laughs> based on the conversations I'm hearing, here's what I would recommend. I would say read the section on criteria with regards to the screeners. Okay, that would be the first thing I would do if I were you. Um, the vendors are being asked to respond to those things. Okay, we know that's the case. ODE is in contact with vendors. ODE is not the customer. Like, that's just the reality of the conversation. Like, we can be in contact and we can provide that feedback as different layers of support, but we are not the paying customer. You have the opportunity right now, seeing what that criteria looks like, to get in contact with your vendor and say, hey, we'd love to continue to partner with you, but look, like this is what we need for you to be able to provide for us. So that would, again, based on the conversations I had, that would be like one next step I would encourage you all to do, is to just really take a critical look at that. Um, again, you are, you are the customers, so they respond to that. So that's a good thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. One question I was curious of, because I really appreciated they separated the books out, because I thought that second book, it reads very much like the Ohio Plan to Raise Literacy, where exactly. it's, it's, it just kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it would be great to have like a one-pager that just says, here's in a nutshell what, this, what, what these 60 pages are saying. So like, yeah. my read as a high school-minded person, mm -hmm. I've got dibbles in place, mm -hmm. I've got a core reading program in place, I've got heavy foundations in place. So I'm doing checklists in my head, but I'm not 100% sure what all check boxes I need to hit. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's great feedback. Yes, absolutely. So is that something maybe we even as a team could like? Mm -hmm. And we don't have ODE's guidebook yet, do we? They didn't release that. The 10 to 15 page that they're doing that you're going to want for that. No. <coughs> they have not released that. We have no. not seen no, that. No, that's our conversation right, right now. And we are all saying, yes, yes, yes. I heard Beth Hess say it's not up for conversation. That is a definite. She told them it is okay. not even 
It can sit, she said, it is a done deal. She said, I'm not asking to. permission. She's not asking permission for it. Okay. Yeah. And, and she said, we just like the guidebook they do for third grade reading guarantee, and she, yeah. she explained to the committee, this is what we do. We okay. put together these guidebooks to aid our districts in implementing what has to be done. And it, she didn't use the word cliff notes or term, but basically that's what she meant. I love that they're going to do that. I still would love an idiot proof one because I feel like <laughs> I may need that. I agree. And then the second question I was going to ask about was if there's been any um, anything that you've heard related to part of the piece I think, at least for districts that are trying to figure out, gosh, my compliance or not, or how much am I going to change, is what is the reporting side of this going to look like? Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, on the PBIS side of things, we as a district kind of label ourselves A, B, C, D. We work with Valpac to make sure. So we kind of have like a, an SST person we reach out to and we say, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, we're, we're heading in this direction. Where should our label be? It, are we looking at something similar to that or are we looking at a whole other layer of EMIS reporting that has yet to be really kind of flushed out? That was discussed in the meeting um, last month. That was not something we formalized because we're waiting to see what that ends up looking like in that second book, which is probably where that will be living. Um, but they did discuss two options, basically reporting to EMAs, having the superintendent report, or kind of um, leaving that up to the district to, to oversee uh, without the reporting. Formally. So if they're taking votes, we'll take the local control. <laughs> I think we would. All in favor? <laughs> it was very. In full transparency, when we were listening to it, um, it was very distorted. I don't know how many other people listened online, but that part was very difficult to hear with full clarity. It did sound like they took a vote. <laughs> um, Michelle, you guys were there in person, so I'm, I'm happy to defer to you on this. I didn't feel comfortable putting that in my notes when I couldn't hear it with 100% clarity until I saw it on paper. Is there anything you'd like to add since you were all there in person? The EMIS reporting yeah. session? Just, I don't necessarily know that they're clear on it. Yeah, so I, I don't cool. even know that. From what I heard, and you guys can share if you heard yeah. something different. I don't, I don't know that all the members of the committee even understand how complicated EMIS is. What they want and what we can offer. They want it to follow a student from district to district across the straight state, and we know how that works in the EL world and every other world that we you know, live in. So I think there, there's a dream. It's actually going to look like what I have in my notes from that particular meeting is that the committee recommends option A because there was an option A and option B, where the superintendent will complete an attestation form for each required year of professional <coughs> development. Um, the option, it says the other option with the, is that there's no reporting of P, uh, this is part of the PD part, sorry, Mike. Yeah, that's repeating. Yeah, right. that was the PD part. Um, I do have here, well, committee recommends for the tier one screen of the district will report each student as on track, not on track, or some other terminology mm -hmm. yeah. that they have not yet developed. So that should be in that other guidebook when we get it, with all of the requirements laid out, but we're waiting to see that. Well, and I assume that's something that probably is going to be, it will be a law, and ODE is going to have to figure it out. And I don't know that they'll necessarily have it figured out at that time when all of that is voted on, but it's something that they know they'll have to do. So it'll be pieced together, as everything else is. But yeah, I don't think there's a clear, I, I didn't hear a clear picture of that at all. All right, so let's just try to hit a couple more things in the time we have. Um, we did put LM against the wall again on the timeline for screener because we know um, that that list is eagerly anticipated by a lot of people. Um, he estimated those lists to be released in late March, early April. So that's what we're looking at right now. Um, there, there will be two lists. Okay, so one will just be, again, that list of um, tier one dyslexia that meets the criteria. Another will be um, that overlay with third grade reading guarantee and tier one dyslexia. Okay, so just, just an update there. And we will have Can you say that date again? Yeah. yeah. Um, he estimated, it was broad, he just said late March, early April. So that was the best we could get. We kind of put him on. Peggy Sorensen, that meeting said March 31st. Okay. Same thing. That they had to do it before December 31st. Wasn't that part of the? That was just develop a guidebook. 
Sorry. Hey, Brad. Not included. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, Dean told them that somebody said told them. I remember at the meeting by developing that draft, they met their requirement by December thirty first. It's not done, but they met their requirement of developing a wow. guidebook, just not in final form. How can we use that logic to apply to our work? So hint, hint, my encouragement to look at the criteria compared to what that approval is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that's exactly what ODE consultants shared with me as well, even yeah. in private. But I, we can do that. I know. But how do we get a test I'm creator afraid. to be able to nationally norm that to give us the information? They cannot. Right. In that window of time. In that window of time. Yeah. Yeah. And trained. Yeah. Trained staff. And uh, there's no budging on the criteria. I mean, we've, I've tried. That criteria is a criteria, and we know what the criteria spells out. I'm sure out. the funding's coming right behind this. I'm sorry. I'm sure the funding to do all this is coming right behind. Actually, out. in my comments, I asked them, I asked ODE, you know, they were supposed to, and I forget the date, well, I think it was December 31st, they were supposed to study three or four or five districts who have yeah. already implemented such practices and look at what the financial implications are and report on that, and they said they'd get back to us on that. Yeah, and they even shared that there are several of us that were on that call or at that meeting that they would be contacting. And I don't know if anybody in this room has been contacted, but I know a lot of us were in that meeting. And I don't think anybody has been contacted that I know of yet. Um, but Beth Hess did share that, keep in mind with your emergency ESSER funds, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that you only have to screen grades two and three So there is that this first year. So that could be a use of your emergency ESSER funds also. And she wanted to remind us that there are those funds that could be used for that. Yeah, we yes. already have them designated as a, yeah. as a result of their deadline. That was a recommendation of hers. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Okay. Maybe we can use our homeless fund for that. <laughs> homeless fund. <laughs> for all our people. That's true. That's it. All right. We're going to keep moving on during your time. Um, Quick update um, on the professional development and certification guidance piece. There is a direct link now on the ODE website for that. I know that was one of the initial pieces of feedback I got as people started to glance through it, is where did that section go? Um, so please notice that that is a direct link that is an updated on ODE's website. It allows it to be much more um, clear and interactive, um, which we appreciate. Um, Know that in my role of filtering feedback, one of the things I've shared is, you know, we're all kind of inundated with these Ohio Ed updates. <laughs> um, if part of those updates could continue to be here, this was posted, here this was updated. Um, so that level of communication is clear. It goes out to everybody as um, quickly as possible as a, again, universal access piece. Because, you know, I know we all just sit in our offices and hit refresh on these web pages all the time and wait for all this stuff to be posted, right? Um, so we're really trying to um, help ODE to create that system of support that's more consistent. So, you know, you're not waiting for these meetings to kind of get updates or we're not bombarding you with um, emails along with that. So please, we just wanted to draw your attention to that. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, you know, that this information will be included in that second companion guidebook piece, um, the practitioner's guide or whatever they finally decide to call it. They're still deciding. Um, so it is kind of nice that absent that second book right now, we have access to this information that's part of the decision making now. So I just wanted to point that out and make it really explicit as well. All right, so again, our next um, regional literacy network meeting will be fo immediately following um, the literacy roundtable on January 18th. So I just wanted to say thank you for your grace and understanding and shifting our last regional literacy network meeting. Um, we knew there were a lot of conversations happening on that Tuesday with the Literacy Roundtable. There were Ed Steps meetings. It was the last week before break. And I'm just going to be transparent and say, if I don't think I can add enough value to your time, I'm not going to ask you to protect space to participate in that. Like, I just, in full transparency, I didn't feel good about it. Um, I felt like we would be continuing to kind of spin our tires in the mud. And you know how that can be. Sometimes you just have to take your foot off the gas a little bit. Um, so we felt it best that we make this shift to following up behind that roundtable conversation. Um, honestly, as I hear conversations unfold, I have scenario A, B, and C for how we spend that time together. But it is completely open 
for conversations that we need to have. I mean, we might just pick one of these, these concerns that we have and work through a problem solving protocol together and see what we can talk about. So I love that we'll have that opportunity before that feedback date closes. Um, I heard Shireen and LM both talking about their data analysis, so I think the more clearly and consistently we can communicate given the same language, our feedback is going to rise to the top of that analysis. So I think um, if we can, you know, if we have one more push that we need to make on that day together, that's an opportunity for us to do that. So again, I appreciate your grace and understanding, and I think it did open up a lot of good conversations um, amongst ourselves. So um, you are welcome. Again, you can register for the roundtable at the link there. Um, please feel free to invite other stakeholders. We're starting to hear from a lot of um, special ed directors, school sites, lots of other people who are saying, I just feel like I want to stay more updated. I'm trying to understand my role in this. Um, instructional coaches, um, please invite anyone. Anyone is welcome to the conversation. So please um, register there if you've not already. Okay, and the last thing we wanted to put in front of you today um, is a free professional development module series for Reading Rockets. I don't know how many of you may already know that this exists, but um, we all know the importance of background knowledge and making new learning sticky, right, and helping it to, to attach to something. Um, I know that some of you have teachers who've been through letters. I know some of you have small groups that are piloting this in a sense and getting ahead of this work. Um, and other teachers who still have not been formally trained in the science of reading. This is a great module that's self-paced. Um, there are certificates at the end of each module with quizzes. There's a pre-test and a post-test and certificates that are issued at the end of each. Um, so you would have a way of um, kind of having evidence of completion, so to speak. Um, it is wonderful. It was created by Reading Rockets plus the Center for Effective Reading Instruction, which is the accrediting body for certification when um, teachers go through that process and take that <coughs> assessment for certification, which we'll speak more about in the future. Um, and this also was created in partnership with the International Dyslexia Association. Um, it has modules for all of those essential components of literacy, plus some early literacy skills and writing. It also has a module on assessment which is really great. You don't have to register or anything like that. You can just hop onto the site. You can actually jump around too. So even as administrators, if you'd like to just work through the module on assessment and really um, go a little bit deeper with your under own understandings of screening and diagnostics, assessment, progress monitoring, and those outcome assessments, it's a really um, well done free resource that we just wanted to bring to your attention. And again, it can be used um, for those teachers who maybe maybe they've gone through a practicum already. Maybe there's another element that they still need to complete before taking that assessment piece. Um, this is one way that they've recommended that teachers can study for the K-Perry assessment, which is part of that process. So just wanted to bring that to your attention. Again, we'll speak more to some of those details later. Um, but we wanted to at least give you another professional development option to mull over. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, um, we're happy to, to answer them real quick. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> All right, thank you so much, um, Amanda and Jen, for sharing that information. Um, at this time, I, does anyone on the call have any questions, um, or anyone else in the room questions, or anything we need to address before we close out the meeting? <laughs>